no effort to remember and care for what they have heard. Thorny soil, which refers to those who hear the word of God, then grow more interested in worldly cares and pleasures. And finally, good soil, which refers to those who hear the word of God and care for it as if it were a great love letter written to the soul. Without seed, soil is just soil. On its own, it cannot produce a stalk or blossom or plant. It requires something outside of itself for that kind of beauty. The only part the soil plays in this parable is whether or not it is ready. In the 18th century, a series of comical stories developed around a man by the name of Baron von Munchausen, a flamboyant German nobleman who had a reputation for telling tall tales. In one story, as a kind of mockery of the exaggerated claims Munchausen made about himself, he falls into a swamp and is only able to pull himself out of it by pulling upward on his own hair. In an American retelling of this story, Munchausen floats over a fence and a barn and a church steeple by, wait for it, pulling himself upward by his own bootstraps. In other words, it's impossible. When we use the expression today, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, we mean believe in yourself, work hard, and you can become successful. That meaning, however, is exactly opposite what the phrase originally meant, which was changing yourself from the inside out is like pulling yourself upward by your own bootstraps. It cannot be done. The image of the self-made man, the industrious type, the overcomer of obstacles who relies on nothing and no one else but his own wits and hard work, this works well in the world of business. It's good, inspiring stuff. But in the spiritual life, it's an impossibility. No one can save himself. A person may be able to replace a bad habit with a good one, but they cannot replace a dead soul with a live one or a foul heart with a fair one. Conversion is an inside job, and only God can do inside jobs. Our job is to create the conditions, prayer, fasting, almsgiving, thankfulness, so that when that seed falls, we're more likely to be ready. Why do 12-step programs work so well for so many people? It may have something to do with the humility of those first several steps, which apply to everyone, because we're all in some kind of recovery. Number one, we admitted we were powerless, that our lives had become unmanageable. Step two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Step three, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood Him. Changing ourselves from the inside out is like pulling ourselves upward to the sky by our own bootstraps. It cannot be done. With God, however, all things are possible. To be humble before Him and rejoice in our need for Him, isn't that a lovely takeaway from Christ's story of the sower and the seed? Often the greatest truths are the simplest ones. Conversion is an inside job, and only God can do inside jobs. For Ancient Faith Radio, this is Father John Oliver. You've been listening to the Hearts and Minds podcast. Father John Oliver is the priest at St. Elizabeth the New Martyr Orthodox Church in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and the author of Touching Heaven, Finding God on the Island of Valon, published by Conciliar Press. This has been a listener-supported presentation of Ancient Faith Radio on the web at ancientfaith.com.
Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory forever. You're listening to AncientFaithRadio.com. He will be a staff for the righteous with which for them to stand and not to fall. And he will be the light of the nations and the hope of those whose hearts are troubled. All who dwell on the earth will fall down and worship him, and they will praise and bless and celebrate with song the Lord of Spirits. First Enoch chapter 48, verses 4 through 5. The modern world doesn't acknowledge, but is nevertheless haunted by spirits, angels, demons, and saints. In our time, many yearn to break free of the prison of a flat, secular materialism, to see and to know reality as it truly is. What is this spiritual reality like? How do we engage with it well? How do we permeate everyday life with spiritual presence? Orthodox Christian priests Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung host this live call-in show focused on enchantment in creation, the union of the seen and unseen as made by God and experienced by mankind throughout history. Welcome to the Lord of Spirits. Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to the Lord of Spirits podcast. My co-host, Father Stephen DeYoung, is with me from Lafayette, Louisiana, and I'm Father Andrew Stephen Damick in Emmaus, Pennsylvania. And if you are listening to us live, you can call in at 855-AF-RADIO. That's 855-237-2346. And Matryoshka Trudy will be taking your calls tonight. Be nice to her. We will get your calls in the second part of today's show. So tonight, our show is about Pentecost. But in what is now classic Lord of Spirits form, we have some groundwork to lay before we get to our full point. So be patient, and you'll find that this pays off at the end. As with any of the major feasts of the church, there are multiple angles from which one can look at them. With Pentecost, we could discuss the feast as the reversal of the Tower of Babel. What it means for Christians to acquire the Holy Spirit, who the Holy Spirit himself is, the gift of speaking in foreign languages, and so on. But our starting point tonight is, as with so many things on this podcast, way back in Genesis. In the first chapter of Genesis, God takes the formless, void world and makes the heavens and the earth and all the life that is in them. And then in Genesis chapter 2, the narrative backs up to the beginning again and retells the story, but with a focus on a place called Eden. So, Father Stephen, what exactly is Eden? Well, Eden is the place where God is. Right. You mean it's not like some dusty town in an archaeological dig in Iraq somewhere? or No, nor is it at the bottom of the Persian Gulf. Uh, yeah. nor is it in, uh, the last, the last history channel documentary I, I watched where they were trying to track down where it was, uh, said there's this city in what's now Turkey built on top of it. Oh, there are some who it's say it's in guess. Missouri. Yes. There's that Jackson there are, County. There are, there are, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. I, yeah. I've been there. It's, it's lovely. Uh, it's, yeah. it's quite lovely. <laughs> and there, there are those who say it's been paved over and put in a parking lot. Uh, yes, but... and there's there's our first '80s music reference <laughs> yes. for the evening. The, uh, <laughs> '80s. Wow. Okay, anyway. I don't remember. I don't know. I, anyway. I, yeah, I will have to look that up now. But... Yeah, sad. Just sad. I know. Anyway, okay. Uh, Eden's yeah. where God so is. This is this is right, and this is this is what we're going to be tracing for folks today uh, to to tell you what we're going to tell you. We're starting at the beginning of the world, and we're tracing the place where God is, okay, where he is at uh, different points in time. And so this is going to be connected to ideas of sacred space and sacred place. Yeah. Um, so, so this is a good one to have already listened to the entire podcast up to this point in order to get. <laughs> yeah. Hit pause, not, not, go back not, and listen yeah. to 30 hours. Of... <laughs> You'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. Well, you should, I mean, you should still be able to follow it, but it'll be much richer if you've listened to the sacred geography episodes, if you listen to the, the, the body episodes. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, right. so here we are. This is the, the place where God is is also, of course, the, the place where you would go to meet God, right? Right. So you can, you can meet a Christian in Christian sands. You can meet the devil in Helsinki. But uh, <laughs> if you want to meet God, you have to go to certain places. Uh, right. And and the point being made by this is not that there's places where God isn't, right? But rather, again, this is about human experience, right? 
where, where you meet God, as you said. Right. This is about where the presence of God intrudes into the time and space that only exist as part of human experience. Right. 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 So, and that's, well, yes, uh, we as all Christians have historically affirmed that God is everywhere within creation. Right. right? It always has been. Uh, it's also very clear just on a surface reading of the Bible that there are places where he really, really is. <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> right. Um, yeah. And so it's that that really, really is that we're going to be uh, focusing on tonight. So the first of those places is uh, paradise, which uh, this is a little bit of review because we've talked about this before. But uh, paradise, of course, the word comes from a walled garden. It's a Persian loan word. Mm. Right. So it is this space that is walled off, sectioned off within the cosmos that has been created and it is not the entire earth at the time of creation right because uh, even though when it is planted in genesis chapter 2 god doesn't tell us east of where he tells us that in the east plants a garden in the east which means it has a location it means there is plenty of cosmos that is not eden at that point yet right it's limited and and when he creates Adam in Genesis 2, he creates him from the dust of the earth and then places him in Eden, meaning that that earth dirt that he's made out of came from somewhere outside. Came from outside. Uh, and that wall represents this, that there's a separation. And of course, we talked about how the intent was that uh, Adam and Eve, as they came to maturity, uh, or that time Adam and woman as they came to maturity uh, would uh, then leave the garden and take Eden, take the presence of God with them. Right. And right. Would, would participate in, take part in, be given the, the grace by God to participate in turning the whole cosmos into Eden, to right. filling the whole uh, cosmos with, with God's presence. Uh, of course, we also know from Genesis chapter three that that is not what happened, right? Um, right. And and so at that point, uh, humanity was expelled from the presence of God. Right. Uh, yeah. And and like most icons of this, you see them, you know, walking out of Eden, kind of looking over their shoulder, and there's, you know, a cherub there with his flaming sword. Um, and um, and some you you get Adam sitting down and weeping over what he's lost, um, but 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 the main point is as you said that they're expelled from the presence of God, whether that sort of literally means that they walk through you know a, a hole in the wall in the walls and you know it, it's not necessarily that way. The point is that they're not with God anymore in the way that they were before. Um, we don't know if that entailed actually leaving a place the way we would think of it now, but but that's that's the way that iconography iconographically it's depicted, which is and and it's the way it's described in scripture. So that's what we've got, right? Right, and often iconography will even depict the wall. Yeah, right, right, <laughs> right. That's a, and so that wall, that barrier, rather than becoming a place that distinguishes the holy place from the rest of creation, uh, it becomes. Uh, a barrier between yeah. humanity and the presence of God. And this is often, uh, as so many things are in uh, the West, looked at as sort of a punishment. Right. 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 You, you, this was this nice place. This was this wonderful place, this blissful place being in the presence of God. And now you've got to go out there into the crummy world because you were bad. Right. Right. I'm sending you away because because you have offended me. Um, right. Right. But that's not what it's about. Um, instead, it's as we've talked about on this podcast before. When, you know, when mankind is created, he's created immortal, created to be immortal and sustained as being immortal by God. But the problem is, is then if an immortal being sins, he's crystallized in his rebellion against God. And so what happens is that God gives them mortality 
so that they would have the opportunity to repent because you need mortality in order to be changeable in that particular way. And so actually being sent out is a mercy. Right. right? It's, it's yeah. not, as God said, it's not good for man to, to live forever in this, in this state. Right. In the state then, of crystallized sin. Right. Because then he right. would have been just like the devil. <laughs> right. right. Who also fell in Genesis 3. And um, that would also mean that the devil would have succeeded. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. that was the devil's goal. Right. The devil's right. goal was to destroy humanity, to make humanity like himself. Um, that's always been his goal. That's still his goal is to make human persons like himself. Um, so, yes, God prevents that victory by expelling humanity from his presence. And this dynam dynamic that happens here in Genesis 3, we're going to see, stretches all the way through the scriptures. Right. This idea that when, uh, while humanity is sinful and while we're bearing in our bodies and our, our souls, our lives, the effects of our sin, it is dangerous for us to come into the presence of God. Right. And and this plays itself out in, well, we're going to talk about a bunch of the ways that it does, but like one immediate way, for instance, is where St. Paul um, talks about a, an unrepentant person in the Corinthian church that has to be cast out until such time as they repent, because it's dangerous for them to be there. It's dangerous for that person to be within the presence of the church and receiving the holy mysteries while they're living an unrepentant life. And I mean, and this is also the basis for a lot of our Eucharistic discipline, you know, when someone's not ready to receive the Eucharist because of some grave sin, they need to be purified before they're ready to, because again, as St. Paul says, those who receive it in that way, some get sick and some die. You know, he says that it's dangerous. It's dangerous to be in the presence of God when you're not purified. Right. And so just as in in paradise man had to be prevented from eating of the tree of life so saint paul has to prevent unrepentant people from trying to eat of the tree of life because and it would be bad for them suffering yes it's <laughs> right. and, and suffering that suffering that faith yeah that faith yeah. so this is this is um, an act of love by god both to protect them from his holiness and to give them then the opportunity to potentially eventually come back. Yeah. Um, and so what then unfolds as we, as we move on in Genesis, what unfolds in Genesis four through six is we see what can happen in the worst case scenario. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Where, where God is still very present in the earth with humanity. And humanity is becoming more, starting with Cain, is becoming more and more wicked and more and more corrupt. And is being more and more dominated by sin, right. by, by the powers of death, by the powers of darkness. Um, and that's building up and building up and building up. Yeah, right in his face. Yeah, right. Because, yeah. And, <laughs> and so this, yeah, yeah, literally, yeah, exactly. And, and so this concept, and we're going to mention this a bunch of times, but this is an important concept. This is called death by holiness. And it's basically that if you are in the presence of God and not prepared to be, it's going to be really bad for you. Uh, not because he's like mad or anything like that. It's just, this is death by holiness. And we see it a bunch of times in scripture. So, and we're going to talk about it a number of those times. Right. And, and the, the God's holiness is over and over again compared to fire. Yeah. Right? right. And in your, in your best case scenario of coming into the presence of God, right? Uh, it's like putting iron into the fire and all the impurities are burned away. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and the, and the iron is purified. That's your best case scenario. In the worst case scenario, the whole thing gets burned and melted away. Mm. Right. And so Isaiah, when the flaming coal is brought to his lips to purify them, that's not a present pleasant experience. Don't try right. this at home. Right. <laughs> <laughs> having a, having a burning coal pressed to your lips. Right. Um, but that purifies him. Right. And so, right. Right. And this is this is because of of God's holiness 
and because of who he is. Right. Um, this is not hit that he likes going around, you know, <laughs> torching people. Um, right. And, an and, this ex and this explains why then that cherub is put at the gate of the garden with a flaming sword. It's not to protect the garden from man defiling it. It's to protect human beings <laughs> from entering in a place that would destroy them. That's what it's doing there. Right. Because it would be it would be better right remember he's be, the 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 cherub is there to keep them from the tree of life right it's better for them to die physically than to uh eat from the tree of life and be immortally dead spiritually yeah right so it's it's to stop them from something worse so as we see this evil and wickedness and sin and demonic activity and corruption build up in in uh, Genesis four through six, this sort of culminates, as we've said before, most famously famously in the Giants episode. Right? Yes. This sort of culminates in in Genesis six verses one through four, and of Genesis six verses one through four, verse three is sort of the uh, the poor ignored cousin <laughs> Oliver of the whole situation. <laughs> Uh, that nobody ever talks about because everybody gets excited about the giants. Yes, right. Well, people, people do. <laughs> Which are in verses one, two, and four. Right. right. Yeah. Giants so and Nephilim. Yeah. So verse three says, "So the Lord said." So this is right after the description of the giants coming around. So the Lord said, "My spirit will not." And then some translation says, "Remain in." Others it says, "Contend with." So my spirit will not remain in, or my spirit will not contend with humankind indefinitely since they are mortal they will remain for 120 more years that's what that verse says right so so what's going on in that verse <laughs> right so god's spirit the holy spirit right is in the whole cosmos right he's everywhere present and filling all things yes and uh that means that all of this sin and wickedness that's happening building up to up to and including what the giants are up to is happening in god's presence all right and so there's this this hebrew verb that's used that is uh can mean either abide in or remain in or contend with uh it can have a positive or negative connotation depending on context uh, and and I would suggest this happens very often with Hebrew, especially in Hebrew poetry, but in Hebrew in general. Um, and you even get some of the New Testament writers because they're thinking with a Hebrew Aramaic brain doing this in the in the New Testament, where they will deliberately use a word that could be taken in multiple senses and use it to kind of mean both. Right? It's porque no los dos. Right? Yes. Right. <laughs> like, yes. It's pun both. fully intended. <laughs> right. It's, right. Remain, remain in, right? Meaning remain here in, in humankind, in the cosmos, right? My spirit cannot long remain there. And part of the reason for that is my spirit being there is having to contend with, right? Yeah, it's, a, it's a struggle. It's a battle, right? Right. Um, and now you notice he, he doesn't say here, um, uh, that um, he is going to depart. Right. That's 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 not this part. <laughs> right. He says he says that the humans are going to depart. <laughs> yeah, they're going to remain for 120 more years. And then, right. So and, yeah. and then bad things are going. To, and so this is what produces the flood. The flood happens because God's presence remains in the world and their wickedness doesn't stop. Hmm. Death by holiness. And so life on earth minus Noah and his family, right? And, and the life in the ark uh, of salvation is, is wiped out because it is in, uh, it is in God's presence and is wicked. I feel like in the back of my head, there is like, an Avengers Infinity War 
joke just percolating up somehow, you know, about destroying all life and it being inevitable and yeah. so forth. But it's this just not more than 50 percent, though. Yes, a little bit more than 50 percent. Yes. Ninety nine point nine nine nine. Well, that's because Thanos isn't God. Right. You just and, can't do that, yeah. And the reason it's water, we've talked before the sea, right, Yom, this is this is chaos. Chaos, right? yeah, the force and of chaos. And so what God essentially does, the, the way the flood actually happens and the way it's described, it talks about the water coming up out of the ground and the water coming down out of the sky, right, which is reversing the second and third days of creation. Yeah. Right, so God just stops restraining he stops protecting oh, wow. right humanity from the chaos and evil that he's unleashing in the world this is this is how punishment works in the bible yeah there's All the patience patience yeah. god has patience for a while and then it's like okay time's up right when god punishes people he's not actively torturing them or inflicting pain and suffering on them right the way punishment works in the scriptures is god just stops protecting people yeah from their actions and from what they're doing and lets them suffer the consequences right right and so this is what happens here he lets chaos come back and consume the cosmos hmm. and then he recreates again yeah takes it back to tohu abohu right and then yeah that's the the formless formless and void right 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 yeah. from genesis genesis 1 2 um and so then after afterwards we have this symbol of the rainbow right uh which is not as some folks might think it's not like god tied this beautiful shiny colorful bow around the earth <laughs> right <laughs> Isn't it no, pretty? it's yeah, it's bow like the weapon, like right. with arrows. Yeah, right, bow like bow and arrows, and God sets it down. Right, it says he places it in the clouds. He sets it down, which is is in the ancient Near East. Right, when someone's going to war, they're depicted iconographically, right, as holding a bow. Pharaoh's right. holding a bow. The king of Assyria is holding a bow. Right, so God setting his bow down says, "Okay, I'm not going to go." to war with humanity anymore right and you will know that this promise is true because you'll be able to look up at the sky and see my bow still sitting there that i haven't picked it up again hmm. right and so he's saying when he says he's not going to destroy the world again right he's saying i'm not going to allow humanity to get to the point where it it they destroy themselves by being in my presence. And so that's why we see in Genesis 10 and 11, we see something at the same time, very similar, but, and very different unfold. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it doesn't take long, right. For things to start to go bad again. Uh, you know, Noah sets down and they start rebuilding, but there's wickedness with, I mean, we don't need to go into it, but there's wickedness within the house of Noah, not too long after, you know, after all of this. Um, and then eventually you get the 70 nations. They're all descended from Noah. Um, and they start doing bad things again, especially one particular construction project. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Yes. And, and there's some build up to that in the genealogies in Genesis 10, which, right. Again, for some reason, not people's favorite part of Genesis, <laughs> the genealogies. Um, but uh, there's this fella who shows up in the genealogies. Uh, there's a couple important things in those genealogies, actually. I think we already referenced in a previous episode the prophecy that Noah's father Lamech makes about Noah, which is really important in framing the flood. Or that's actually the previous. That's before the flood. Sorry. Um, mm -hmm. In this, in this, at the Table of Nations in Genesis 10, that's laying out the 70 nations and how they're all descended, we run into this fella, Nimrod. Right, which is not just a, a way of referring to, it's not just an insulting thing to call somebody, it's an actual, actual right. person. Right, or, yes. a, or a super popular pendant from the 70s to have hanging amidst your chest hair. Oh, uh, wow. You can look that up if that's you were alive back then. Um, 
<laughs> but, oh, uh, yeah, so, so who is Nimrod? This actually came up in the Lord of Spirits Facebook group the other day, you know, asking, is Nimrod a giant? Because of the way he's described as being this mighty hunter before the Lord, right? Yes. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> Nimrod is indeed. Nimrod is the, um, he's serving the purpose in the narrative of being the founder of Babylon. Hmm. Okay. Um, now there was actually another Assyrian city named after him, Nimrud. Okay. Uh, which was, which was the, uh, military center of the Assyrian empire much later. Uh, <laughs> centuries later, but this is all part of Ahad. This is all part of the northern part uh, there. But the reason they're named after him is not that, oh, hey, you remember that hunter guy in the Bible, in the genealogy, <laughs> right? Uh, that's, the reason for that is that Nimrod or Nimrod is the, uh, lexically, it's the same name as the god Ninurta. Yeah, so who's who's that? I think a lot of us probably have never never heard of Ninurta. Uh well, haven't you been reading your your uh tablets from the library of Esser Banapal II? Well, you know, Seriously. there's still there's still 90% of them have not been translated yes. yet. So I haven't gotten to those. Well, that's why I said people need to get to it. Come on. Yeah. You're sleeping on these tablets. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. So, Ninurta is one of the primary gods of the pantheon, and one of the was one of the main gods of uh, the original Babylonian Empire. Yeah, uh, associated with farming, healing, hunting, law, scribes, and war. <laughs> so it's right. kind of a nice portfolio there, right? Because he 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 was essentially for a period of time serving the function of Most High God. Yeah. So yeah. if you're someone who has that role, even for a little while, you tend to take on a big package <laughs> right, right. of stuff. Right. <laughs> right. Um, and uh, now this is the original Babylonian Empire. We, we have a bad gauge in our heads a lot of time of how old things are in the ancient Near East. So when we think of Babylon because of the Old Testament, we may think of like Nebuchadnezzar. Right, right, or maybe later. his his dad Nabo Palasser. That's the Neo Babylonian Empire. Hmm. That's the new one in the sixth and seventh centuries BC. Yeah. <laughs> this um, is this is what a, a couple thousand years before that. The original one, yeah, we're talking about like twenty five hundred BC yeah. and a few centuries before and after. So we're talking about like Hammurabi. Uh, we're talking about the Martu, who are the biblical Amorites, right? Who we already talked about in the Giants episode a little bit. Right. So this is one of the gods of, Bab of Babylon at that time, right? Gotcha. At that time. And so uh, what the, the text is doing in Genesis 10 is it's tying this to this particular Nephilim fellow, right? Mm who is the city founder figure who becomes the god Ninurta. He ends up, his spirit ends up being worshipped by uh, the Babylonians. That's what's going on here. And it's part of Genesis showing us that that uh, the whole Nephilim thing is even starting to happen again. Yeah. Right. Just like in the genealogy of Cain that we had before the flood. Now we've got this genealogy of the nations and oh, looky, right? <laughs> the whole Nephilim thing is happening again. Um, and uh, then we this culminates with the Tower of Babel. We talked before about how um, the Babylonian Babili means the, the gate of God, the gate of the gods. Um and how this temple, this ziggurat that's being built, uh, was looked at, um, and how they were trying to draw Yahweh, the Most High God, down, and and sort of uh, make him serve their purposes in their ziggurat. yeah yeah it's it's you know being a, a gate right it's it's essentially rather like trying to break into Eden, right you know we'll make our own paradisaical garden on our own paradisaical mountain and we're going to make god come down here 
um, and and be with us and do what we want, right? Which is, you know, <laughs> that's not the way that God set things up in Eden. You know, it, it's it's a it's it's a, a violent sort of aggressive technological you know kind of approach to relationship with God. Right, and and it's it's based on this in Genesis that every future empire that's talked about in the scriptures all the way up through and including Rome is described in terms of Babylon. Mm. It's the prototypical bad civilization. Right. The, the, the starting with the city that Cain founded, right. This is continuing that streak and, and that's going to continue all the way up into, into Rome. But so we, if the same thing is unfolding again, God has promised that he's not going to wipe everybody out again. Yeah. Right? right. And so all the people in the world are all gathered around the the ziggurat. God is trying to calm them down. He said he's not going to destroy them all again. So then what is the other option? The other option is for God to remove himself. To leave. Right. For God to leave. And so this is why, again, it is out of mercy. This is why God steps back at Babel. And as we read about uh, more in Deuteronomy chapter 32, why when he steps back, he assigns the 70 nations of Genesis 10 to the sons of God, to angelic beings. Right. So there's this buffer between him and them. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right? So, so that they won't perish. Yeah. And it, it's, you know, it's fascinating how much of the action of what goes on in Scripture, and we're going to see this more and more as we talk, but it's fascinating to me how much of the action of what goes on in Scripture is really about this very basic dynamic of dealing with the problem of death by holiness, you know, of people not being ready to be in the presence of God. And so then the things that happen as a result of that. Um, it's, it's, it, you know, it's fascinating how this is kind of a unifying principle for so much of what's going on in scripture. Yeah. And, and part of the reason we miss it so often is that in our contemporary world, we've almost completely lost the idea of sacred space. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know, in <laughs> fact, even, even amongst Christians are like, well, isn't every place sacred, you know, which, which what that does is like, so, so that's correct. Although you know, spoiler alert that we'll talk about that later. But, but what it effectively does is it makes it so that nothing is, no place is sacred. Or just like, for instance, those who, who object to having holy days on the church calendar, like, well, you know, every day should be like, it's Christmas. Well, when every day is Christmas, then no day is Christmas. <laughs> you know, like you tell someone every day, every day should be like your birthday, right? So then, <laughs> then no day is your birthday, you know, like that, that's, that's what tends to happen is this, our sense of egalitarianism, uh, flattens everything out, you know, I, like that's in the, the intro to our show is, is this, is that secularism, materialism makes everything flat. And, you know, this is part of what's going on. Right. It doesn't, it doesn't take what's lowly and broken and lifted up. No, it takes what is high <laughs> and lifted up and pulls it down. Yeah. Right? right. And that's why iconoclasm is such a perfect instance of it. Right. Yeah. Right, is is that it's pulling down and destroying right something that that is otherwise beautiful and uplifting yeah so um, okay so now we've got god has withdrawn himself from the nations and assigned angels to them to govern them by proxy um and and you know what happens with them later is well we've talked about that before right. uh, <laughs> but there's this, still this problem then of god's sort of active presence in the world being withdrawn and he's, he's not going to just leave it that way, right? Just let us be distant. Right. Something's got to change. Right. Because the goal was, right? Remember, the goal of the expulsion from paradise was so that there could be repentance, so yeah. that they wouldn't end up eternally condemned. Yeah. And so the goal of withdrawing here, again, is so that the people won't perish because God doesn't want them to perish. Right. So what we get then in Genesis 12, beginning with Abraham, and there's a monster time lapse here, but <laughs> what we get with, with uh, Abraham in Genesis 12 is the beginning of salvation. Right. And Abraham is living 
in the midst of Ur, probably around the time that they're building a big ziggurat, right? Right. Uh, you know, that right. he would have looked up and seen this thing and, and yes. lived in its shadow. Yes, and that's that's where the memory of that, that he was there in the Ur three period when the great ziggurat of Ur was being built. Uh, the memory of that is why you sometimes find in, uh, especially in Tar uh, Targumic traditions uh, from later Israel, there are these things connecting Abraham to the building of the Tower of Babel. Mm. Even though the, the text clearly doesn't do that, but there was this preserved oral memory of the building of a ziggurat in Abraham's lifetime. And those two things kind of got blended together due to their proximity in the, in the Genesis, the Genesis story. Um, uh, but so Abraham is, is the beginning then of salvation. This is what distinguishes lots of theories out there about what distinguishes Genesis one through 11 from the rest of the book of Genesis. But, uh, sometimes genre, sometimes all kinds of things are suggested. Um, but what really distinguishes it is that Genesis one through 11 is outlining the problem, right? How we got here. And then yeah. Genesis 12 is the beginning of the solution. It's the beginning of salvation. And this is why when we get to the New Testament, anytime St. Paul or someone else is talking about salvation, they start with Abraham. Yeah, right. Um, that's, that's where they go to, because this is, this is the beginning now of, of the recovery. And so you have Abraham, who, who Yahweh draws near to personally. And literally, he draws close to him personally. He appears to him repeatedly. <laughs> right? yeah. uh, he stands in front of him and talks to him, right? But uh, Abraham and his immediate descendants are living as nomads, right? They leave Ur. Uh, and, and Ur, in the Abraham story, notice, is identified as Ur of the Chaldees. Which, yeah, what's, what's that about? Yeah, it actually isn't. Ur of the okay. Chaldees. Ur was in Sumeria, not Achad, and it <laughs> and it was the Babylonian Empire uh, didn't really exist at that time and didn't control Ur. But more than that, the term Chaldean refers to the Neo Babylonian Empire. But it's called Ur of the Chaldees uh, in uh, the Genesis text. Precisely to make the connection to the to what just happened with Nimrod and the Tower of Babel. Oh, interesting. Chaldeans are Babylonians. Sort of more like Ur, like the Chaldees. <laughs> right, right. Sort of, yeah. So it's it's a it, it's making the point that when when God does come and appear to Abraham Abram at that point and calls him out, right? He's calling him now out of out of. Babylon. He's calling him out of the city. God had already withdrawn himself from that, and now he's calling Abram out to come out with God uh, away from that civilization. Yeah. And so the, the, the place where God is, since Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jacob's sons are living nomadically, uh, the place where God is, is with them, wherever they are, right? And so this is why all the way through up to, up to Moses, and we'll be talking about Moses more in the second half, um, when God identifies himself, he doesn't identify himself as the God of a place. Right, right, which, right. which is, you know, like what most people, most uh spirits of that time were associated with you know the, the local god basically territorially local right. right right he's he's in genesis 1 through 11 he's god most high he's just god <laughs> right the right god of gods right from genesis 12 on for a good long while he's the god of abraham isaac and jacob yeah, so it becomes local, but not local to a place. It's local to these people. Right. He's local with, to he's with them. people. Yes, yeah, he, he is with them. Traveling around with them. Yeah. And he, he appears to all of them bodily, <laughs> right? And so what we see in terms of sacred space is not 
a temple or temples, right? It's not that kind of thing. But at these places where Abraham, like at Mamre, or uh, Jacob, like at, at Bethel, Right, uh, where he wrestles, wrestles God there. Where, where they encounter Yahweh personally, where he appears to them, where they, where they interact with him, they build an altar there. Right. And then that is the place when they come back ritually and offer sacrifice on that altar, they're making the time when they were there in the presence of God to be that time again. Yeah, so right. they basically go on pilgrimage back to those places, and by means of offering sacrifice, they're they're there again. They're then they're then again. I right. Put it. Right. I have to sort think fourth ritual, dimensionally. Ritual time travel. Yes. <laughs> yes exactly. <laughs> right. Yes. Uh, they don't travel back in time, but that time becomes sure. this time. Right. You know, and you don't have to go eighty-eight point eight miles per hour. Right. So. Right. 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 You don't need. Right. You need zero gigawatts of. Uh, <laughs> Um, so, and, and as a note, if you actually look at those altars in the patriarchal narratives and the stories of the patriarchs in Genesis 12 through 50, uh, there are 12 of them. And there's okay. one in each of the territories that God later assigned to the 12 tribes of Israel. So if they had done what they were supposed to do and taken the land they were supposed to take, each one of them would have had one of those shrines, hmm. uh, within their territory. Hmm. Uh, but of course they didn't. Um, <laughs> Disappointing. Right. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know if there was giggling or not, though. But anyway, um, so uh, then before we before we move to Act 2 and uh, yeah. get to our friend Moses. So, before Moses, there's, there's this big time gap between yeah. the patriarchs and the beginning of exodus right right Where... right it's like five to seven hundred years of space between them i mean you know so basically you know jacob and sons are in egypt and then five to seven hundred years later you get the exodus and, right you know you go what's, from what's going on <laughs> right you go from 70 not coincidentally people who go down into egypt um to you know, what's going to become the nation of Israel. And so the, during that time, during that, this, these centuries, right, where is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Right, right because where is Yahweh they're, during this time? They're, I mean, as far as anyone on earth is concerned, they're dead. So God right. isn't hanging around in the cemetery. Right. Um, yeah. So where, the where, question where did is, did, did God just withdraw again for a few hundred years and then come back to Moses, right? Or well, follow them into Egypt. I mean, what right. would happen if he had followed them into Egypt? That would have been probably bad for the Egyptians. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So. As it later is. <laughs> the, the, what's actually in the Bible and some archaeology Tell yeah. us where he is uh, yeah. during and, those and centuries. I'm, I'm just going to preface this, everybody, by saying I had no idea. I had <laughs> no idea. <laughs> this is, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we're, put, put, yeah. Put your, put your hats on so that your skulls don't explode <laughs> too much here. All right. So <laughs> uh, the earliest mention of the name Yahweh as a god that we have outside the Bible. Okay is on a wall at a temple at the city of Solib in Nubia. So this is northern Sudan today. Right. This, it's a this would have been a, a, uh, an Egyptian settlement, right? Right. It's an Egyptian temple built by Pharaoh Amenhotep III as a temple to Amun-Re. And so on the walls of this temple, there are these cartouches, right? And a cartouche is sort of a way of marking off an inscription. So you right. have like usually an oval shape and then the hieroglyphics yes. are within that. I remember seeing those for the first time reading Asterix and Oblix comics when I was a kid because <laughs> we had the Asterix and Cleopatra uh, comic thanks to my dad who bought it in Australia if you can believe it 
<laughs> True story. <laughs> That's how I learned still... about cartouches. I think I still have it, actually. So, it might I mean, be worth money. Oh, anyway. It's probably, yeah, I don't know. That, it would have been so that's my first thought. But. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, <laughs> I think, I, I mean, I, if I do have it, I would have had it since like 1982, 81. I mean, it's a long time ago. Okay. <laughs> but that's how I learned what a cartouche is. Right. So, so these, these cartouches are uh, basically Amenhotep III uh, bragging about all the people who he'd uh, beat up on in war, <laughs> yeah. right? And uh, where they were from and sometimes who their gods were and all that kind of stuff. Like yeah. a, lot of, a lot of trash talk, right? Right. Um, and so in the midst of this was built in the early 14th century BC. Uh, early 14th century would be sometime between like the year 1400 and 1350 okay. BC uh, is when this cartouche was carved. And it refers to one of the people who he had beaten in battle and, and taken slaves were the Shasu of the land belonging to Yahoo. Okay, so who Yahoo are these people? was the common way of abbreviating Yahweh. It's, yeah. It still is. Benjamin Netanyahu has the name Yahweh in his last name. So every time Jewish people say his name, they're saying Yahweh. How in about that, to Some questions we occasionally get from <laughs> listeners. Yes, <laughs> right, um, right. So yeah, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of Jewish names that include, you know, Yahweh in them in one way or another. Like Elijah, right? Isn't it like Eliyahu? Yes. Yeah. That's yeah, the there's, Yah. In, there's the Yahoo. Yeah, the Yah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Right. The Yah at the Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. O Obadiah, right? Isn't that Yeah. 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 Yes, exactly. <laughs> right. Um, so, so the Sha Shasu of, of, of Yahweh's land. Right. Who are, right. Who the, are these it's Shasu? Not, it, it's not the land of Yahoo like the name of the land was Yahoo. It's right. the Shasu who come from the land that belongs, belongs to yeah. The God yeah. Yahweh. It's, it, yeah, it's a possessive genitive. Right. Right. Um, right. And there's a, sh a similar inscription uh, in uh, Amara uh, West from uh, the 13th century BC, so from about 100 years later. Okay. That also talks about the Shasu who are from the land belonging to Yahoo. And you don't have to look far to find out in Egyptian records that the Shasu are uh, what they called the Edomites. Right. So these are descendants of Esau, the brother right. of Jacob. Right. The Edomites, the descendants of Esau, uh, the settled members of that group were called the Edomites. They were settled in the land of Edom around Mount Seir, S-E-I-R. And then there were also the Midianites, who you read about in the Old Testament, were basically uh, a mixed group of Edomites and Ishmaelites. Okay. Um, so that's that's who the Midianites are. So all these people are descended from Abraham. Right, because they're sons right, of according, according descendants of Esau. Yeah. According to Genesis. Right. right. Um, and and it's and it's this bunch. So we actually meet one, right? Uh, I don't know if we meet any before him, but but we meet one in Exodus. Uh, when Moses goes out into the wilderness and uh, spends, what is it, 40 years out there? Yeah, um, Moses goes on the lamb. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. After killing away. somebody. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. Jesus, it's the law. Yeah. So he... <laughs> <laughs> right. So he's out there and he meets a local girl and marries her. That's Zipporah. And her father is Jethro. Um, and he's a priest. And he's a Midianite. And... He's a priest of Yahweh. He's a priest of of the right, the Most High God, right? Of the Most High God, and so he's the one who then imparts, right, uh, uh, the knowledge of who Yahweh is to Moses. Shows him where the mountain of God is, right? And when when God introduces Himself uh, to Moses, He says, "Right, your forebears knew me as El Shaddai, as the God of the mountain." Uh, but, uh, 
you will know me as as Yahweh, right? Um, so what this shows us, both from again reading Exodus and from this archaeological find in terms of what the ancient Egyptians of that time knew about those people, is that the worship of Yahweh had been continued by the rest of Abraham's descendants, at least to this point, who didn't go into uh, Egypt. Right. And it's not just this, well, hey, look, there's Jethro. There's right. a bunch more about this. There's, yes. In there the Old Testament, if yes. you look closely. Yeah, there's multiple references. Um, and I'm just going to rattle off the <laughs> the references so people can look these up. Um, Deuteronomy 2, 1 through 5 and 12, Joshua 24, 4, Judges 5, 4, and then Ezekiel 35, verses 1 through 15. And they all reference Mount Seir, if I'm correct, S-E-I-R, once again. You could actually just do a, a word search on, you know, the BibleGateway.com for the word Seir, and you'll see all these um, references to it. And like, for instance, the one in, in Judges 5, 4, right? Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the region of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped. Yes, the clouds dropped water. So you get God, he's in this place called Seir. He, right. And it identifies this as is, be the, the Edom, you know. Right. In Judges 5, they're describing Yahweh coming to lead the people of Israel into Canaan, into the promised land. Yeah. And he comes to do that from Mount Seir. Right. Right. So that's where he, he was there being worshipped by the Edomites. And then he comes from there to lead the people of Israel. In the Deuteronomy 2 verses that you mentioned. First, uh, it, it's that when, when the Israelites came to the Edom, they were just kind of hanging around there for a while. And, and God had to kind of tell them, hey, Moses, come on, get it get it moving. We got to get into the promise. <laughs> yeah. right? Yes, I'm here, but this cousins, is, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> I'm here, so, but this is not, this is not the place. <laughs> right. And, but he says there, he says, you are not to take literally one foot. It says the length of one foot, <laughs> one human foot. You're not to take one foot of their land because Yahweh says he brought the Edomites there and gave them that land. And he's giving Canaan to the descendants of Jacob. Yeah. Um, and, it's, and, and isn't there a reference? Is this the one in Deuteronomy 2, 12, the Horites? Right. Uh, who are in Syria. Uh, now, are those giant people? Yes. Yes. So God, clear, about, <laughs> God clears out giants and brings Edom in to live he, in Seir. Right. He used the Edomites to clean the giants out of land and give it to them directly parallel to what he's about to do in the book of Joshua. Yeah. Right. And uh, so there's this direct parallel. God did the same thing with Edom that he's going to do with Israel. He did it there first. Um Joshua 24, verse 4 that you mentioned, that's at the end of the book of Joshua, where Joshua's laying out uh, how God had fulfilled all the promises about the land that he made to Abraham. Attention, our dispensationalist friends. The yes. book of Joshua <laughs> says that God, in the conquest, fulfilled all the promises about the land that he made to Abraham. It literally yeah. says that. It's but, been fulfilled. <laughs> Part of that fulfillment, according to Joshua 24, verse 4, is that God gave the land of Edom to the descendants of Esau yeah. and brought them in there and gave it to them. Uh, and then uh, the last one of those references you read in Ezekiel is the other end. It's after Judah has gone into exile. And at the time Judah went into exile, the Edomites sort of used that opportunity to do some pillaging and some expanding of their territory and to sort of turn on their brothers and gloat over Jacob. And so Ezekiel is promising the Edomites that because of their wickedness, they're going to suffer the same fate Judah did. Yeah. So there's this direct parallel between what happens to Israel and what happens to Edom in the Old Testament. They're treated fundamentally the same way. Cool. Well, everybody, now you know where exactly God was during those five to seven hundred years. And knowing and is half the battle. It, it G.I. Anyway, <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, <laughs> we'll be back in just a moment uh, as we continue this discussion as we head towards Pentecost. But uh, right now we'll take a break. 
Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung will be back in a moment to take your calls on the next part of the Lord of Spirits. Give them a call at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. This is an Ancient Faith Radio public service announcement. The Mental Health Task Force of the Assembly of Canonical Orthodox Bishops has recently launched two mental health initiatives, a National Directory of Orthodox Mental Health Professionals and an Orthodox Mental Health Needs Assessment that are available at www.assemblyofbishops.org slash mental dash health. The Directory of Orthodox Mental Health Professionals features licensed Orthodox Christian clinicians across the U.S. who are available to serve as resources to those seeking mental health care, substance abuse care, and or professional consultation. While the Orthodox Mental Health Needs Assessment is an anonymous survey for all Orthodox jurisdictions, clergy, and laypeople across the U.S. The aggregate data from this survey will help the task force better understand and address the mental health needs of Orthodox faithful through the development of ministry resources. Once again, that web address is www.assemblyofbishops.org slash mental dash health. This We're back now with the Lord of Spirits, with Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung. If you have a question, call now at 855-237-237. 2346. That's 855 AF Radio. You, Voice of Steve. Always great to hear from you. I actually had lunch with the Voice of Steve um, last week. It was just his voice. Yeah, well, you know, I, actually, his his uh, his his body was was present in all of it. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> it so this, his this whole isn't nexus like, of potentialities. This isn't like a Metatron situation that no. we have going on here. Okay. <laughs> yes, okay. he's not the Metatron <laughs> uh, or, or Megatron. Um, yeah. So, all right. Well, we do have a caller waiting. So, uh, she's been patiently waiting. Yvonne has a question about the Tree of Life. So, Yvonne, are you there? Yes, I am. Can uh, Thank you for taking my call. Can you hear You're me? You're welcome. Yes, yes. Welcome to the Lord of Spirits oh, podcast. Great. It's it's actually about the tree of um, knowledge, and it's a quick, quick question, and then if it's okay, I have another quick question after that. But everybody calls it the tree of knowledge, but you know how it's the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Is that, are they saying it's the tree of, like, judgment? Like the old, you know, the old-fashioned definition of judgment, which was like discern. I not, I don't mean like condemnation. I mean like discerning, knowing good and evil, knowing right and wrong. Is that, is that what that means? Yes. <laughs> I'm just okay. going to go out on a limb and say yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Am so I somebody... correct in my yes, Father? I just want to make sure. <laughs> stealing, stealing my bit. Yeah. Um, well, what people, can I say? Yeah. If if so you when go. When people say like, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was, I was going to say, if you as you go forward in the in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. that phrase "knowledge of good and evil," what it's yeah. used for in the rest of the Old Testament is sort of coming of age or maturity, right? Like right. a child becomes an adult when they're able to know good and evil. Right? Yeah. So the idea is it's not an evil tree. The idea is that there would have been some point when Adam and Eve had reached a point of maturity where God would allow them then to come to that knowledge, right? They would have been mature enough and prepared for it, but they try to seize it for themselves, right? Or the devil gets them to seize it for themselves, right? right. By telling them, you'll be like God if you do this, right? You'll sort of leapfrog the process. Right. Yeah. Okay, right. so what, what was your, your follow-up question then, Yvonne? Well, then, um, you were talking about, oh, gosh, now I feel, oh, Abraham, Abraham, right? How he was in... Um, by the Tower of Babel, you know, when it fell apart. So was he, it doesn't even matter, but is it true that he had the original language? Um, you know, like how before the languages were divided, um, whatever, like, would he have had the, because Paul said that when he said, what benefit is there in being a Jew? And then he goes, oh, much in every way, because they're the keepers of the oracles of God. Does that mean like that they had the, pre-Diluvian language, and would it even matter, or and did Abram have that if he was by Babel? So, 
Well, I mean, I would love to say that the original language was Lithuanian, of course, um, <laughs> or old or old English, one of the two. But not um, likely. Not likely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No. So, so Abraham, you know, as we just said, Abraham was associated with the Tower of Babel in in Scripture, right? But he's not actually there. He's a lot later, right? Um, so yeah. by the time by the time we meet Abraham, the nations of the world have already been divided up into many many languages. So could right. he have had the first language? Like, could he have held on to it? You know what I mean? Because there's a, I know you said that genealogy is really boring, but there's a um, <laughs> guy, he's an author, and his name is Von Hepner, V-A-U-G-H-N, Hepner, and he writes these fictional books, but, like, I actually have, like, you know, because he's so, his books are so good, and they're very, very easy to read, like, he goes into the genealogy. That, that's what he does of Genesis. And um, but anyway, I think he suggested it in his books that maybe when Babel was um, spread out, that one of the groups kept the original language. But I guess nobody did. I I mean, like, did anybody have had the pre-dilute? Like, is there anybody that yeah, had I it, mean, or was it, it just wiped out? I, I would. I would. They talk about like the books of Enoch and stuff like that being from pre-diluvian. Like somebody would have to speak the language, right? Well, but we, we, we obviously we don't have any copies <laughs> from back oh, yeah, from back then. Right. Yeah. But um I I think most likely it's gone. Um okay. You could tr you could try to do that with Sumerian, I guess, because Sumerian is a really weird language. It's not related to any other language in in Earth history. It's it's weird. Um in that regard. Um but at the time Abram lived in the in the Ur three period, he I mean there were Sumerian words that got incorporated into other languages, but he would have been speaking a version of Akkadian by that point. Right. They, Which um, is a Semitic language. Right. A Semitic language. Cause, yeah. Because they do this um genius like if you follow the if you like do the the math, um wait, who is Shem Hamp? One of the sons of Noah would have still been alive when Abram was alive, and like they suggested in this book that um, he could, they could have talked to each other or met. I guess it doesn't matter; it's all fictional. But yeah, yeah. The 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 problem with that approach. Uh, this will get people grumpy at me. The problem with taking that approach <laughs> to the to the genealogies um, is that. Um, if you try to take any one of them literally in the Old Testament, you run into trouble with some of the other ones, first off. Like, they, they don't match. And the way ancient genealogies were written, they didn't list every single generation. They just listed important figures. Mm -hmm. um, so, especially the, the genealogy of, of Abram, it, there's probably a lot being skipped, and here's why. Um, because if you take those numbers and you say there's no skip generations at all, then there are only 300 years between the flood and Abram. Mm -hmm. And it seems, un or not the flood and Abram, between the uh, Tower of Babel and Abram. And it seems unlikely to me that you would go from all the people in the world being in one place to... Abram being able to meet the Pharaoh of Egypt and they have a whole civilization over there in Egypt and then they have a whole other civilization in Sumeria and another one in Syria and there are kings and there are developed different languages and all that that all of that could happen in 300 years. Yeah, it it it, it, it it's just not a thing. <laughs> It's just not. Plus, the other thing is, is that, you know, just even speaking from a linguistic point of view, language changes a lot. And there's no even if someone is safe living for hundreds of years, there's actually no reason to believe that they wouldn't change the way that they speak along with everybody else. Right. I mean, I've lived in different parts of the United States and I even lived on the island of Guam for a while. And the way that I talk has altered. Right. I do not sound like the southerner that I was born to be. I sound now more like the Yankees among whom I live, you know, um, and, and that's just within my few decades of life. Um, languages change over time. They simply do, especially when you don't have, um, you know, mass culture like television and radio and so forth and, um, and mass literacy. It, 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 everything just goes a lot more quickly in terms of the way that it changes. So it's just it's just not plausible, you know, on, on any measure. Right, so, right. 
All right. Well, does that answer your questions, Yvonne? It does. It does. Thank you so very much. All right. Well, thank you for calling. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, now that we've uh, uh, we, we've watched God come out of Seir and come to rescue his people in uh, in Egypt, um, although we well, or should say we see that in progress. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go to another mountain, right? We're another significant mountain that, yes. yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> another mountain that is being the mountain of God. And that's Sinai. Right. So um, we, we've already seen one transition, or a couple actually, but we've seen this transition to God being the God of these particular human persons. Right. Right. And being where they are. And then we saw him being at this mountain. Now we're at Sinai, of course, we see, um, well, at first with Moses, right, we see the same pattern we saw with the patriarchs in the sense that Yahweh, the God of Israel, is with Moses. Right. He's with Moses and Aaron when they go back to Egypt. Right. He's now with them as people. But once we get to Sinai, uh, we then get uh, the instructions given to build the tabernacle. And so this then is going to be a transition where there's going to be this place where God is going to be, where his presence is going to be in this particular tent. Uh, which is going to be set up at the center of the Israelite camp while they're wandering in the desert and making their way. They're going to pitch their tents and camp. And another thing that people love reading, their favorite part of the Torah, is the detailed instructions in the book of Numbers about the order in which the tribes march and where they set up camp in relation to each other and to the tabernacle. I know. That's like <laughs> the big... Everybody's super excited about that. We should but, do a big cosplay reenactment or something. Right. <laughs> right. So, but the, the tribes camped around, right, in a circle around the tabernacle, right? Right. Uh, and that, just that way of camping, you have God dwelling in the midst of his people, and you also have this idea starting to develop that we're going to go into more detail here in a minute, of these sort of concentric circles leading out from where the presence of God is. Right. Right. You've right. got the presence of God in the tabernacle, then the next circle out, you've got the camp, and then outside, then you've got outside the camp. Uh, so this is, in a certain way, a return to the way things were in Eden or Paradise. Yeah. Right? Because you had the walled garden, right? And then you had the world outside of it. And you now have the world outside the camp, and then the camp with the um, with the tabernacle at its center, and that's why you get the Edenic imagery in the tabernacle. Right. Uh, so, but for our purposes tonight, uh, where we're eventually going to talk about Pentecost, uh, <laughs> the, yeah. um, the most important part of this, and we t we talked before the sacred geography and stuff. We talked a little bit about the tabernacle there from that other perspective, but uh, we want to talk about uh, what unfolds in Leviticus eight through ten, right? As the tabernacle is put into service and consecrated. Okay, so before we get to that, we actually do have a caller. Um, so Christopher is calling, and uh, Christopher, are you there? I am. All right. Well, Christopher, welcome to the Lord of Spirits podcast. Uh, what is your question or comment or insinuation for us this evening? <laughs> well, uh, I'm reading, or uh, just actually just finished Father Stephen's book. And oh, I, you have a book? You have a book, Father yeah. Stephen? He, he does. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know if Ancient Faith still has it, but yes, I, I, I do have a book. Buy them now, everyone. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. Go ahead, Christopher. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, well, I have a question about the uh, the angels that God assigned to govern the nations and cities, and uh, I wonder how all of them became corrupt and demons, uh, because I know they're um, they're talked about in Tolkien and in Lewis's till we have faces, and they have a mixed influence there, good and bad. Right. So, so how did all of them become corrupt? <laughs> The guy just choose the wrong ones, or well, well, it depends on what you mean by how did. <laughs> right? Okay. Um, well, so it, it, it's not all of them because there's Saint Michael, right? Okay. Number one, right? So <laughs> that right, was one right. at least. But also, also, um, 
I I think um I think one reason why people under uh, misunderstand this point is that I haven't effectively communicated what I'm hopefully about to effectively communicate. Uh you'll have to tell me. But sure. um so it it's not just a question of well okay there are these 70 individual angelic beings right yeah. plus Saint oh. Michael and those particular beings are assigned to these nations and each of those beings individually goes bad right okay um so in 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 some cases that's what happens that that individual being goes bad right but you okay. also have cases like Ninurta that we were just talking about where the people of a given city begin worshiping a demonic entity. Okay. And by doing that, that demonic entity, by them becoming demonized in their worship of him, that demonic entity becomes the power that's controlling that city. Yeah, they're so, a sort of d dark patron. Say sorry? that again, Christopher? It's, it's the people that are causing it by making it an idol? Well, so so what he's saying is that in some cases, you've got essentially a good patron who goes bad by virtue of accepting worship that's being offered to him by the human beings under his care. But okay. in the case, for instance, of Babylon, it's being depicted as you've got probably a giant spirit. So we're talking about a demonized human soul who interacts with the locals and they begin worshiping him and taking him as their patron so he was already bad before they started doing idolatry with him okay so that's how you get bad patrons in one way or the other right and so the, obviously there are now more than 70 nations right <laughs> different places right. in the world right right and so a lot but but what the scriptures do tell us is that all the gods of the nations are demons yeah right uh, and what the pagans offered sacrifice, they offered to demons, right? Yeah, there, so, there's, there's no indication that any of them are still worshiping Yahweh. Right. That's the key. Okay. They're not worshiping so Yahweh. So if their the angel... If, 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 during, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. So by, uh, by St. Paul's time, when he writes in 1 Corinthians, when he says all the, all the gods of all the city-states, those are all demons that had all just they'd fallen by that time. Well, or they're worshiping another spirit, right? So none, none of none of the none of the nations of the world go on to worship unfallen angels, right? Okay. Right. They okay. they, they yep. stop worshiping Yahweh, the true God, and they start worshiping other things. So in some cases, that's the angel who was assigned to them, who has now fallen, and is participating in that worship. In okay. other cases, it's some other demonic spirit that they started worshiping. Okay, that distinction helps. Yeah. 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 And okay. and, and so, but the the point is that it's now the demon who's in control, right? Through sin, okay. through the power of sin, and, and through death, who has now enslaved those people. Okay. Does that make sense? It, it does make sense. Yes. All right. I got to the end of the book and. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's There's always going to be more, always going to be more questions. So, yeah. All right. Well, 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 thank you very much for calling, Christopher. Good to talk okay. to you. Thank you. Okay. So we were talking about the tabernacle um, and we were just about to discuss how it gets consecrated. So how do you consecrate a tabernacle? Right. <laughs> Not that I recommend going and doing this. Yes, right. Don't try record. this at home. This is not how to is it like, hey, guy, hey, kids. Yeah. Have fun. Yeah, you especially know, once you're about to hear how, how, it's, how it's done. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so there are, there are sort of uh, two principal things that are done and then something happens, right? So um, all of the elements. So when we talk about elements here, I'm talking about the physical objects that make up the tabernacle. So physical objects like the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering, the tent posts, the tent pegs, the uh, goat hair curtains, right? <laughs> all, all the things, right, that oh. are going to be put to get, physically put together to make the tabernacle. And the tabernacle then is going to designate the space where it is, right, as sacred. All of those things are first uh, purified with sacrificial blood. Right. right. 
Purified from what, right? Well, they're taken out of the world, right? We've talked about this before in previous episodes. They're taken out of the world where they have the taint and stain of the sin and wickedness in the world on them, right? And it's not just a question of them being pure enough to come into the camp. This is going to be God's presence, so it has to be completely pure. And so the sacrificial blood, like in, in the Day of Atonement, cleanses these physical objects. Then they're anointed with oil. Right. And then after that has been completed, then the theophanic glory cloud. A certain group of people just got excited. Yeah, that's uh, going to be the name of my next band. Theophanic yeah. <laughs> glory cloud. The, uh, you're inclined to do that, are you? Uh, the, the, <laughs> I, got, so, I, I caught that reference. <laughs> yeah. So the, the, the fiery cloud, which is the presence of God, which is the Holy Spirit, really right the presence of god in the world the one who who couldn't bear with man before the flood right um uh and had to leave now comes to fill the tabernacle yeah right comes and fills the tabernacle so now the question of where is god is answerable because he's in the tabernacle now right yeah this is yeah. this is this is where he's going to be located as the israelites for 40 years are on their way um to the land of Canaan. And so then in Leviticus 10, right after this happens, the story of Nadab and Abihu unfolds. Right, which I feel like should be the a scriptural passage that is covered in the first day of liturgics and seminary. Like, I think it's just be a good idea. It's just, just to scare you, everyone. Yeah, or yeah. you know, print, printed it. You know, right now, like, the Liturgicon has the commandments of St. Basil the Priest, which are excellent. There should be also a, a, a page where you just simply include this passage. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, the uh, Nadab and Abihu are two of the sons of Aaron. Right. The high priest. And so they're, they're, in, they're Levites, right? They're... Um, they're part of the priestly bunch, right? And well, the Le the Levites. Uh, well, anyway, we won't go to that. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, sorry. <laughs> sorry. yeah, they're in the high priestly family. They're in the high priestly the family. Yes, the high priestly family. Exactly, exactly. And uh, so, people argue about what exactly the problem was, and you get different hints in different parts of the text. Uh, I go for a an all-in approach of they did everything wrong, right? Yeah. So we know from the text that they were drunk. Right. We know from the text that they went in to offer incense at the wrong time. Right. Maybe because they were drunk. Right. And we also know, because it's called strange fire, that they offered... Uh, the wrong kind of incense, right? Because there's the whole incense recipe and how they were supposed to offer it, right? So they're drunk and they do everything wrong <laughs> in terms of what they were supposed to do in their duties to go into the tabernacle as priests. And they fall over dead. Fire comes out from the presence of the Lord and consumes them. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Death by holiness. Right. And so this is not only, right, we see this theme again, but this is an object lesson now to all the people in the camp. Right. See, right? this is what I'm saying. We need to put it on the church yeah. books. <laughs> that the fact that God is now dwelling in their midst is not just, oh, lovely, right? Yeah. Isn't right. that nice? Right. I really, I really is... feel like God is here tonight. Right. <laughs> This is that should scare you. Yeah, this yes, is <laughs> right. When someone says that, I know this is this is a serious thing, right? A serious thing, and so they need to conduct themselves uh, accordingly. And so, when the Day of Atonement ritual that we've already gone through in detail in a previous episode is given in Leviticus 16, yeah, when it's when it's given, it's given expressly right at the beginning of the chapter. It's given because of what happened to Nadab and Abihu. Right. That's verse one of chapter 16. <laughs> the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they drew near before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, etc. Right. <laughs> and this was this was a good five chapters previous. Yeah. Right. So right. it's brought up again here to remind this is why. Right. Um, and so this process is put in place for the cleansing with blood and reconsecration 
once a year of the tabernacle, the purification and reconsecration every year of the tabernacle, so that the priests will be able to go in safely, come in safely into the presence of God, right? The purification that's necessary for them. And expanding out from that, this is what the vast majority of the Torah is, right? Yeah. The law. Torah, not like the first five books, Torah, like the law, right? Um, the way we think about it, this is what the commandments are aimed at. The commandments are aimed at, and this includes both what we'd call quote unquote moral commandments and what we quote unquote call uh, uh, purity laws and all of it, right? Uh, that distinction, by the way, was first made by a second century Gnostic. I had to throw that in. Anyway, mm. <laughs> uh, what the whole thing is aimed at is God is now living in our midst. We're now in the presence of God. This is how we need to conduct ourselves to do for that to be safe. Because if we don't, one of two things that we've already seen in Scripture, in Genesis, one of two things is going to have to happen. Either... God is going to, the language that's used in the Torah is God is going to break out in the camp and people are going to die. Yeah. If he stays and we are impure and wicked. Or out of his love for us, he's going to have to leave and then he's not going to be with us anymore. We don't want either of those things to happen. And so the Torah was laying out what had to happen for that to, to be possible. And uh, then you get, because of that, this is, and I know we've talked about this before, at least briefly, you have those concentric circles, and those concentric circles, the closer you go in, the more purity is required of you, right? So the Torah sets this standard for purity for the Israelites who are living in the camp, who are living near to the presence of God. They have to have a higher standard of holiness than the rest of the world. Right. This is why God never tells them, you need to go and make the Syrians stop eating pork. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, yeah. Right? Because it's not law. It's not actually law. <laughs> right? It's not some kind of eternal legal moral standard. That's, it's not that. It never functioned as that. Yeah, it's right? liturgical preparation, basically. Right. And so they didn't have to enforce that to anybody else because they're not living anywhere near God. They're not drawing near to the presence of God. So they don't need that holiness. Now, if they want to, if they want to come and eat the Passover, well, then they have to be circumcised. And then they have to start start following the, the commandments right? Uh, which, so that they which, can safely draw close to God. Yeah, which, I mean, has an obvious pastoral application in our time, which is, frankly, that, you know, the only people, I mean, however you want to slice it, the only people who are actually going to be effective in terms of convincing them to follow the commandments of God are those who are trying to draw near to him. You know, the people who are not have no reason to do that. You know, I mean, you could try to convince them of its benefits or whatever, but, but, but really they don't, they don't have any good reason to do that. And, you know, if you look at the command that Christ gives the apostles, he doesn't tell them, go into all the world and tell them to do my commandments. It's go into all the world, baptize them, make them disciples and teach them to do all that I have. Like it's the whole point is, is that it's entry into the church that involves all of that. Right. It's the uh, other way. Yeah. 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 It's, it's not, you know, way. it's, it's not. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the call to repent is a call to draw near to God because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what's going on. It's precisely this exact same exact same dynamic right but so yeah. yes on one hand we live in a society so i'd rather right. not have to worry about my heathen neighbors murdering me right yes right but, <laughs> there's a certain amount of restraining that needs to go on <laughs> right right but right. On, on the other hand on the other hand uh me trying to go and get people who don't know christ to live a moral life has no value any, it has no more value to them to have lived a moral life rejecting Christ than it would for a a worshiper of Ninurta to not eat pork. Yeah, right. <laughs> like it, it 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 means nothing. It does nothing. Right. Um, right. So this is, this is all about drawing closer. So the, the the Israelites have this higher standard than the surrounding world. The priests within Israel, who are the ones who are living and working in and around the temple have a yet higher standard 
right? The, the, the regular people in Israel did not have to maintain the level of purity that the Levites and the priests did. Um, and then the high priest, most of all, right? Because the high priest had to do all the preparation for the Day of Atonement for that one day when he went into the, the Holy of Holies. Yeah. And so uh, when we get to uh, Solomon's temple, the first temple, all of this that we see in the tabernacle, which is mobile, gets concretized, right? right. In terms of a fixed building in a fixed yeah, place. Stationary. Right. And, and it's important to note that this was not God's idea, right? He didn't, because I mean, how, how many times does he say in scripture, God does not dwell in temples made by hands? Right. Um, God, it's not God's idea for them to build a temple, but he agrees to it um, just as it wasn't his idea for them to have, uh, you know, a, a human king. He, he agrees to it, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Right. And and there's this great disparity, right, that you notice very quickly when you actually read the text, right? You, you go to ex the la whole last half of Exodus is all of the minutia of the instructions for every element of the tabernacle being given in detail twice. Yeah, God, right. it's God's blueprints, l yes. literally. Yeah. Yes, and they're yeah. all laid out, and then it describes them doing it in the same level of detail. So you get it all twice. Uh -huh. Um you you don't get that with the temple. Yeah, it's literally it, man design, man it, Yeah, and, and the way that the temple is described is actually almost identical to a Syrophoenician temple built at the same time. Hmm. Uh, meaning a pagan temple built at the same time. Right. Um, now, when I've said that publicly before, I've had people come to me and say, well, <gasps> hey, there's this, there's this one verse in First Chronicles, that if you read kind of sideways and squint at it, kind of sounds like God gave David the plans for the temple. Okay, and my response to that is, let's say that's what that verse really means. Do you still think that one verse with a passing mention in First Chronicles is comparable to the whole second half of the book of Exodus <laughs> in the Torah? You don't see any difference there. Right. I, I just kind of love the fact that someone is reading the Bible so closely that they come to you with that, though. So that's great. <laughs> yeah. Assuming they weren't Google searching to try. And, yes, you know. there's that as well. Yeah. Yes. The um, Google School of Theology. But, but um, you, you see this very clearly when you when you see the dedication, right? We're talking we talked about the dedication of the tabernacle. When you look at the dedication of the temple, you see this very clearly in terms of Solomon's prayer and then God's response, because Solomon's prayer is very much, I mean, it's it's virtually Tower of Babel kind of stuff. Mm. It, it's moving in that direction, right? It's, Lord, whatever anybody prays toward this temple, give it to them. <laughs> right? It's, you know, God, do all this stuff related to this temple as object, right? Um, it's very close to, like, we want you to come live at this object, and then we're going to use that fact to get what we want from you. Right. Good stuff. And so then the flip of that, God responds and goes into great detail about how he did not ask for a temple and he does not live in buildings made with human hands. And he's not going to automatically do that. And if they keep the commandments, he will bless them. And if not, they're in trouble. Right. He lays all that out. And then at the end basically says, but because I know you are human and weak and hard hearted, I will condescend and I will come to dwell in this building. Right. So then then again, <laughs> right. they do the purification with blood, the anointing with oil. And then you get once again, the name of my next band, the Theophanic Glory Cloud. Right. Comes and fills, fills the temple. Yeah. And so then this is the place where God is. Uh, Israel is destroyed by the Assyrians, the northern kingdom. Judah, right? God departs from the temple and they go into exile. And you see the two fates there, right? You see death with the northern kingdom. You see exile, right? God having to remove himself with Judah, with the southern kingdom. Hmm. And he does that again so they won't be destroyed like the northern kingdom. Yeah, because they, won't because be they fell into evil. Right. They go into exile yeah. just like Adam and Eve were exiled from the garden. So that they can repent and eventually, and eventually yeah. return. 
Yeah, so then after, I don't know, how long is it in the Babylonian exile? 70 uh, years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they come back and they rebuild the temple under Ezra. Um, so you got the second temple. Thus, this right. is our term, second temple Judaism, right? Right. Um, and and they, they do the consecration service, the blood, the oil, but there's no theophanic glory cloud. That's a big difference. Right. Yeah. Right. Does that mean and, it doesn't and, work, that the, the temp, that they're not actually worshiping there? I mean... No, they're offering the sacrifices there. Yeah, but it's sort but, of from a distance, like a Bette right. Midler song. But there is no there is no direct experience of God happening there. And then Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes, the Seleucid monarch, comes and desecrates that temple, and it falls into ruins. And the Maccabee brothers get torqued off and <laughs> go and, and uh, stage their successful war uh, to reclaim uh, the temple and to regain their independence. And they go and they rededicate the temple and but, start the celebration of Hanukkah. But <laughs> no theophanic glory cloud, even after that rededication. Right. Yep. Right. Even after all that. And so um, this is something that in the second temple period, they were keenly aware of. Yeah, and, like he's, God did not come back, right? Yeah, and and even and even then, I, I can't remember. I'm, I'm I'm the timeline is is not clear in my head. But the when the the Roman general Pompey actually, when was that in relation to the Maccabees? That was a uh, hundred and ten years later. The Maccabees were under yeah. the Greeks. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so then the Romans come in, and the Roman general Pompey decides to go walk into the temple and go all the way into the Holy of Holies, in which. Like if if this had been five hundred years before, or whatever, <laughs> would have meant um, he would have been struck dead before he even got in. But he goes back there and he just doesn't see anything, and he's like, "Oh, they must worship their god with their minds," you know. Yeah. Like he's so impressed by that, <laughs> but but literally, but it but but God's not back there. Yeah, he's not the Ark of the Covenant isn't even back there. Yeah, all that's back there is literally an empty cherubic throne, right? an empty throat. And so they, they were aware of this. A and this is part of why they understood themselves to still be in exile. Right? It wasn't yeah. just that they were still being dominated by the Persians and then the Greeks and then the Romans. Because there was that brief period with the Maccabees, with the Hasmoneans, when they were independent. Very brief. Uh, they made a treaty with Rome and it was a bad idea. Uh, that's how they got annexed. But um, they were aware of this fact right god hasn't come back uh we're still under foreign domination this isn't it right and so we see this language in the new testament of restoring the kingdom to israel we we see this language and these various groups various judaisms of this period relate themselves to the temple of jerusalem in different ways yeah. we tend to think that they all accepted it but they didn't so the the qumran community that produced the dead sea scrolls their whole basis was of going out in the desert and doing sort of reconstructed temple rituals out there was because they rejected the validity of that temple, right? Mm. They're like, God's not there. This temple's bogus. Uh, there were the, the Jewish community in Elephantine in, in Egypt who built their own temple there. Um, I did not know that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Is there anything left to that? Is that around at all? Yeah. Yeah. You could see where the Well of Souls was and stuff. You could see basically like the floor plan of the oh. foundation. Suddenly I'm um, having Indiana Jones flashbacks here. But, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so, right. So, so th they were aware of this, that this hadn't happened. And that, that they're looking toward deliverance especially associated with the messiah and and this is part of what that deliverance is going to bring is not mm. just you know we're we're so used to history being written in the 19th century german mode that you know we think oh they're all looking for a political messiah like that like yeah. politics was separated from everything else at that time yeah no they um, wanted they <laughs> wanted god back in their worship center right they wanted the romans out and they also wanted god back yeah. right? and those two things were related Right. Right. Uh, right. So uh, as we end this half, <laughs> right, um, 
I wanted to break down for a minute because I don't think we have this in our heads fully. Um, when we talk about the tabernacle or the temple being in the midst of the people of Israel and this kind of thing, I think somewhere in our heads, most of us have this idea that it's like, well, that's where they went to church, right? <laughs> because we're, we're kind of reading our own experience back into right, right their experience. Right. And, and often Orthodox Christians will not entirely incorrectly say, well, you know, our, our worship is, is, is like temple worship. Right. Um, which is not totally wrong, but it's wrong in certain key ways. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. So let's um, let's imagine what it would be like if a modern, you know, Orthodox church actually functioned like the temple or the tabernacle. Right. Like what would that actually look like? Right. Right. So we're going to say your local Orthodox parish right, is the ta tabernacle or the temple you're an ancient Israelite pilgrim uh, going there for one of the feasts, right? Because it was, right. we talked about before, obviously, without fast travel, people weren't going there every week, right? Right. Um, so uh, this is a lot more like Eden, right? Which was still closed and the cherub with the sword is still there, right? You're, you're right. near. You're able to draw near to God, but not go into his presence. So if you're the average person, uh, you would come to the narthex, right? right. Of your <laughs> local Orthodox parish. You would lead your animals to the narthex or you would bring money because there would be people in the narthex and in, in parts of the parking lot selling sacrificial animals for people who couldn't came from a long way away and couldn't bring animals with them. Right. And you would get your animals, you would then give those animals to the priest. Okay? The, the, the priest would go take off with the animal, take it to the place called the prothesis. He'd kill the animal, he'd butcher the animal, he'd skin the animal, separate the meat the way he was supposed to, right, under, under the law. He would take the portions that were going to God, he'd take them out into the parking lot and burn them on a big barbecue pit out in the, <laughs> right, out in the parking lot. He would then hand you your wrapped up pieces of meat to take with you to eat with your family. And that would be it for you. Right. You wouldn't that go, would be your visit. Yeah, you wouldn't go into the equivalent of the nave. Right. Uh and, and you and only the priests would go there. Yes. Uh and and, and you know the, the Holy of Holies, which in modern Orthodox church is, you know, the, the sanctuary, the area where the altar is, no one would go there except what once a year, the high priest would go there. Right. Uh, and and the, the women and children would stay in the parking lot. Right. They the male head of the, the family narthex. would go in the narthex and deal with the priest uh, <laughs> and, and actually make the exchange. Right. And the priests would go for matins and vespers. They would go into the nave and only the nave and offer incense and prayers twice right. a day. And then one day a year the high priest, equivalent to the bishop, would go back behind the iconostas only on that day with a big cloud of incense and, and purify the place and then come out. That was worship, right? This is, this is our uh, pre-Christian worship if we put it into those terms. Right. So I, th I think we need to realize just how shut out from the presence of God people still were in order to understand the reality of what we have now going on yep. in, ch in church. And with that, we're going to go ahead and take our second break. We'll be right back. Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung will be back in a moment to take your calls on the next part of the Lord of Spirits. Give them a call at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. No end of books these days offer us techniques for self-improvement. But in the newest release from the Ancient Faith Store, Gratitude in Life's Trenches, Robin Phillips takes a different tack. He shows us that God meets us where we are, in the pain and heartache of the present moment. 
Instead of looking for a way to escape from hardship, we can cultivate an attitude of gratitude, peace, and self-acceptance that will transform our experience of suffering. Drawing on his own experiences and his work as a consultant in the behavioral health industry, as well as stories of saints and sufferers, teachings of the fathers, and recent discoveries in neuroscience, Phillips shows us that the journey to personal well-being is one we can all travel, regardless of the hardships we may face. To find this book and others like it, you can go to store.ancientfaith.com. Again, that is store.ancientfaith.com. We're back now with the Lord of Spirits, with Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung. If you have a question, call now at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. All right. Welcome back, and thank you for that, Voice of Steve. Uh, we, would, we would love to hear from you, so do give us a ring. Okay, so we just talked about how the actual experience of a worshiper in ancient Israel was and compared it against uh, our, our, our experience now as Christians actually coming to church, coming into the nave, men, women, and children. Um, and actually having and <laughs> seeing the veil opened to the Holy of Holies, you know, very different from uh, ancient Israel. Um, and so there, there has to be some kind of transition between these states. So let's talk now about what happens in the New Testament. There is a transition, and it starts with a young, young girl. What was she about? What did they say? She was two or three years old, I think? Yes, yeah. When she was yeah. old enough to be brought to the temple, the Theotokos. Um, so this is a little bit pre-New Testament. Right? Okay, yes, <laughs> yes. All right, well. Slightly yes. pre, pre-New pre Testament. Um, yes. And uh, so we have, we have a, for, for folks who are listening who aren't Orthodox, uh, we have a feast, right, of the entrance of the Theotokos into the temple. Uh, because as uh, has been handed down to us uh, by... Christians since this happened, um, who I don't think are liars. Uh, the, the Theotokos, uh, when she was born to her parents, they were at an advanced age. And so to give thanks to God for giving them, uh, their child, uh, St. Mary, they brought her to the temple to serve as, uh, one of the, uh, virgins there. Uh, this right. was, an institution that already existed. It goes actually back to the tabernacle. Um, one of the rarely discussed uh, offices of the Old Covenant was that there are there were women who lived at the entryway to the tabernacle. Hmm. So they couldn't go into the courts of the tabernacle, but they lived just outside the gates. And they were dedicated to assisting the priests and the Levites in terms of sewing cloth, uh, preparing things, repairing things, uh, feeding people, uh, taking care of all of these sort of duties. And so when the temple came about, um, and we know for sure, because this is recorded, people talk about it with the second temple. But when the temple came about, obviously you have it now in one fixed place. You had these women who were dedicated to, and, and they're referred to as virgins because they didn't get married. Right? right. So rather than having res having children, having responsibilities to a husband and children, they dedicated their lives to taking care of these things. And and because of that, they had to maintain a higher level of purity because they're closer. Right. Right. Than, than the rest of than the rest of the people. And so the Theotokos was brought to be one of these women when she was a, a young girl. Right. Which I mean, and just as a sidebar, I mean, what a what a contrast that is to what the nations were doing, right? They right. also had women that were that were hung around their temples at shrines, but they were, yeah, yeah, and yeah. shrines, and they were the opposite of of you know virginal, pure. Like it was, it was, yeah, exactly. Now we <laughs> could be, we could be fair and throw the Romans to the Vestal Virgins, but that's a whole other discussion. Yes, um, <laughs> right. But but and, and th this is also important, and I won't delve into this right now, but. Sometimes we get questions from our Protestant friends about the importance of the Theotokos as ever virgin, that she was always a virgin through her whole life. This is a big part of that. 
Yeah, because she's been set aside for this. It, you're right. It's part of her dedication of her whole life and self to God. That's the focus of that, not anatomy, right? Right. That's not primarily what it's about. Um, so, um, so th this happened, and then uh, what? What our forefathers of the faith have handed down to us is that then, when she she came of age, because of those same purity laws, she could no longer remain in those temple precincts, right? And so that's when she was betrothed to St. Joseph. Right, uh, as her protector. As as her protector, who was an older, widowed uh, man who was to care for her, right? Um, and then presumably at some point in the future, she would have, right, if, if she hadn't, you know, given birth to our Lord, uh, she would have come back to, the, in the normal process, she would have come back to uh, the temple to continue serving in that capacity. This is also the role that the prophetess Anna has mm, yeah. uh, at, when Christ is brought to the temple to be dedicated. And there's this widowed woman there who's been living there for years since her right. husband died. Right. She is also one of these women. Um, but so in, in the feast, we celebrate her being brought to the temple. And the story that's been brought down to us is that she, in sort of a contrasting parallel to the general Pompey, uh, went back into the temple itself and went back even into the Holy of Holies. Um, and this is, this event is, uh, we have in iconography, uh, we have it in the, the, the feast, the festal celebration every year and in, in the hymns related to it. But the key element of this that's being brought across to us and that is relevant for what we're talking about tonight is that this is the beginning of that transition. Right, right. And she's welcomed back there by Zechariah, the, the, the priest, who, of course, you know, he he knows, you know, he, he's. He, he's he, well, it happens later, but I mean, he's the father, the forerunner, like he's got this prophetic uh, place, you know, um, and, and I, I think a lot of the hymns talk about him, you know, the Holy Spirit comes upon him and he welcomes her, you know, to to do that, which is I mean, that's the appropriate thing for a priest to do. A priest is there to serve as the one who connects people to God. Right. But in this case, she's coming to be. She's essentially in, in some ways coming, not quite to take his place, but but she's there to fulfill that role. She's there to be to be the temple. Right. Because she's that's where God is going to dwell. Right. Even though this is the second temple. So technically, that's not that's only kind of the place where God is. Yeah. It's only sort it's of not symbolically the place where God really is. really a temple. Yeah. Um, her womb is going to become the place where God is will be whiz for nine months right yeah. uh while while christ is within it and so this sort of handoff right sort of takes place uh, at this feast and at this uh and at this point yeah. um, and so she is being set apart to be god's dwelling place and so in in our uh our tradition that we've received uh, the understanding is that the Theotokos, like the tabernacle and like the temple, was purified by the Holy Spirit uh, for this role. Right, and and there's a couple different there's a couple different views amongst the church fathers as to exactly when that happened. Um, some of them, like Saint John Chrysostom and some others, say that it happens at the Annunciation. So she's purified when the Archangel Gabriel comes to her, and then the Lord is conceived within her womb. But then others um, say that she gets purified in her mother's womb, but notably after her conception. So after yes. she's conceived in the usual way by her parents, God purifies her in the womb of St. Anna um, so that she is then prepared throughout her life. So there's variation on this point between some of the church fathers that's okay it's okay it's all right right, right. they okay, everybody. all agree that she was purified <laughs> yes right? and to that it happened where god was going to dwell. yes and they all agree that it happens before uh the conception of the lord um 
and uh, you know, it's just a question of exactly when before that. Right. You know? and, and someone might ask, why would she need to be purified in, in the womb, right? Obviously, she hadn't committed any sins, right, in the womb, right? Right. Um, <laughs> but the response to that, of course, is that, yeah, the goat hair flap of the tabernacle that Moses purified with blood and anointed with oil hadn't committed any sins either. Um, right, right, right. That's not yeah. what it's about. It's not yeah. moral L guilt. Yeah, go go back and listen to our atonement episode <laughs> for a full right. treatment of that. It's about dealing with the residue of sin in the world. Right, existing in the world. Yeah. <laughs> right, uh, and her being set apart for the special purpose of being being purified um, for this purpose. And and this isn't just this this crazy Mary thing that us Orthodox folks came up with. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, there are the, other the, there are other saints that experience this, too. Right. Right. So in, in our our traditional understanding, right, St. Saint, Saint John, the forerunner was purified and received the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb. That's why he was able in the womb to give testimony to who Christ was when yeah. the Theotokos came to visit St. Elizabeth. Uh, the prophet Jeremiah says God set him apart from his mother's womb, right? <laughs> to be, right. to be the prophet. So th this is, this is something we see repeatedly in scripture and, and in the history of the church, that there are yeah. particular individuals who, who God sets aside and calls to a particular purpose. And when he does that, he comes and he purifies them. And sometimes it's later in their life, like St. Paul on the road to Damascus. And sometimes it's all the way back in their mother's womb. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, like, you know, sometimes you see something like that and you might think to yourself like, well, how come I wasn't purified in my mother's womb? And I, ha I, you know, I have to struggle against sin and whatever, whatever, whatever. But number one, that that is simply not the way that the world works. But, but number two, uh, like anyone who had this, they usually went through a whole lot of suffering uh, as they fulfilled God's purpose for them. You know, al almost all of them. So like. You know, it's not necessarily, it's not something you should ask for, you know, if it's something that God gives, then, then you're responsible to that. Um, but it's not something that God gives to, to very many. There's certain people that he has a particular purpose for them. And so this is what happens. Right. And you don't necessarily really want to drink the cup, the cup that they drank. Right. Um, and, 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 and aren't there certain <laughs> cases even where, like, if I remember correctly, we were just reading the readings last night uh, for the Feast of the Nativity of the Forerunner. And one of the readings is about Samson. And it doesn't it say that he's, you know, from his mother's womb. And yet that didn't turn out well, ultimately, you know. Um, what? Samson didn't turn out well? I've yes, never heard, yes. I've never heard this before. Big sinner. Big yeah. time sinner. Okay. Big okay. time breaker of promises. <laughs> if you to say God. So. If you yeah, say massive so, Father Andrew Damick. Murder uh, slash suicide at the end. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, right. And, and so, so this is the, like we said, this is the beginning of the change, right? And yes. of course, right, with, with the Theotokos, right? The, the Theotokos, the, the great gift she was given by God is that she got to participate in the salvation that comes through her son most fully and completely and directly and personally. Right. Right. And so when Christ comes, we have all of this language, particularly concentrated in St. John's uh, gospel uh, regarding Christ being the new temple, not the new temple to replace the second temple, the new temple, like the one Ezekiel prophesied about during the exile. Right. Right. That it wasn't that second temple that it's actually it's actually Christ when he's born. And so we see that at uh, Holy Theophany at Christ's baptism in uh, John 1, 32 through 34, the Holy Spirit comes and descends upon him and then rests within him, comes to right. abide in him. The presence of God comes and stays. Um, Almost like a theophanic glory cloud. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then uh, in John 1, verse 14, as part of St. John's prologue, he says, literally in the Greek, the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Mm. And we saw his glory. Yeah. And that he was full of grace and truth. Right? So that's the imagery of Christ's flesh being 
like the the uh, the curtains of the tabernacle, <laughs> right? And God's presence, God is dwelling among us, right? In in the flesh of Christ, and He is full of glory, right? Like the glory, the Ephanic glory cloud that came and filled the tabernacle and the temple. Yeah, and 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 you know to double down on His identification as the dwelling place of God as being the temple in John chapter two, verses 19 through 21, this very famous passage where, you know, Jesus says, uh, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. And the Jews then said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. And will you raise it up in three days? And then this amazing editorial comment from St. John, but he was speaking about the temple of his body. You know, that 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 his body is the temple of God in their midst. Right. You know, and, it's and, it's not that building. It's it's him now. Right. And, and Christ isn't just the new temple, but he's the final and eternal temple. Right. Right. That one that Ezekiel talked about. And so that's why also written by St. John in the book of Revelation, chapter 21 in the new heavens and the new earth. There's no temple because the lamb is there. He is, right. Yeah. And if you want to read that Ezekiel reference, by the way, it is literally the last nine chapters of Ezekiel, chapters 40 through 48. Uh, and it's, it's, it's stunning stuff. Um, yes. Really, really, really beautiful. And it's talking about Christ, dispensationalist it's, right. friends. I, I don't yeah. want to pick on our dispensationalist friends too much tonight, but. Well, we're talking about temples and stuff. So. Has to happen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Bound yeah. to happen. So yeah. now. Oh, and so. The, the other place where this language of, of a temple is used, of course, related to the Holy Spirit, is St. Paul. Right. Right. And he talks about this at a couple points in 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17 and 6, 19, where he says that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Right. And, so so again, wait, the Holy wait. Spirit, that, yeah. That's not just about, like, you eat right and don't smoke or drink? Your body is no. the temple of Holy Oh, oh no. okay. No, I'm I'm more on the side of the meme that my body is a temple. It's broken down, abandoned, and decrepit. Right? Like, <laughs> so, but um, not one stone shall remain yeah. upon another. <laughs> so, um, but right, yeah, y'all's y'all, whole... y'all's body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Right. Yeah. And this isn't this sort of separate, independent thing. Right. Where where there's now a whole bunch of temples. Right. Not just Christ. Right. It's it is just Christ. Right. As St. Paul says in Galatians three, verse 27. If we've been baptized into Christ, we've put on Christ. That's why St. Paul says in Christ after just about everything. Right. He just adds it on to almost every sentence. Right. (laughs) That we our bodies have the Holy Spirit in Christ. So Christ shares his templeness or templitude, right? Tem- with us. Templosity. Yeah. <laughs> with us, right? If we are in Christ, then we are functioning as part of, as a member of his body, right? Yeah. Because Which is we're, the temple. We're his nexus of potentialities. Right. Right. And so now. Dun, dun, dun. In our Pentecost episode, we're going to talk about <laughs> Pentecost. Yes. But there's even just... a little bit of build up to that. So... <laughs> right. Right. Yes. Yes. We prepare to prepare to prepare. See, our, yeah. our podcast really works like the Orthodox liturgical year. Yes. You know, it's just it's a year every episode. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or this a major. Is... Yeah. Yeah. A major liturgical season. Yeah. There, there's a reason for this. And only a few people out there will know what I'm talking about. But I had too much Yale school preaching in my ba- background. So that's how you end up structuring things like this. But, right. um, so, so, uh, yeah, me saying now we're going to talk about Pentecost was actually sort of like, let us complete our prayer unto the Lord. Like we yes. still got a little ways to go. Right. Um, exactly. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> Luke chapter 24, one of my favorite chapters, uh, because it's about Eastern Pennsylvania. No, <laughs> it's about the, uh, this, this passage. So Luke 24, um, towards the end, uh, Christ meets with two disciples as they're walking along the road, Saints Luke and Cleopas. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago, uh, a few weeks ago, with the the, the post um, post resurrectional period, you know, appearances of Christ. Uh, this is Christ on the road to Emmaus, um, and and 
Why is this important? Um, it's on the road to Emmaus. Yes. Emmaus yeah. in particular. Right, right, exactly. So, so we talked earlier about the Maccabean Revolt. So that uh, is successful at a battle that took place at Emmaus. So Emmaus right. is like a, a, a famous battlefield uh, in, in this time and place. So like the example that, you know, from our time, it, again, to bring it back to Pennsylvania, uh, if, if someone would say, you know, they were on the road to Gettysburg, you're like, oh, Gettysburg. Yes, yes. I remember what happened there. And that's exactly the same thing. Like Emmaus is this famous place because of the battle that happened there. And so everyone would, would see would, when, they, when you would read that, right, in Luke's gospel, what you're getting then is this reference to this battle that was fought and won there that led to then the temple being rededicated after it had been desecrated. So right. that's all part and parcel of on the road to Emmaus. Right. right. And so people, people miss this a lot because they say they think this is the only place Emmaus is mentioned in the Bible. But if right. you go and get your 1611 King James... And turn to First Maccabees, <laughs> right? Which is in the 1611 King James. Yes, I, I have a uh, replica of. I have a, I have a replica of it here in my studio. Right, the Battle yeah. of Emmaus. This is the climactic battle where the the Seleucids are defeated and and uh, and driven out. And so, yeah. So this is what's being conjured up here is not just the battle, but the aftermath of the battle and the idea of the rededication of the temple. Right. And the proof that St. Luke has the rededication of the temple in mind is how he ends his gospel. Right. The last two verses of St. Luke's gospel, Luke 24, verses 52 and 53. Right. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, blessing God. Right. And so you may notice that you know, this is volume one. When you go to volume two in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, they're not hanging out in the temple. Right. When St. When Luke narrates the ascension again, he doesn't describe them going back to the temple. Right? right. So he's not that, you know, he's making things up one time or the other. It's just what he's choosing to focus on. So why does he choose to focus on the temple here at the end of the Gospel of Luke, it's to bring out this dynamic, right? Christ has just won this victory, right? That's what the Gospel is. It's the report of a victory. Um, book from Father Andrew coming soon. Yes. Uh, and, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And, and so, <laughs> Look, I have been selling your book a lot, so I expect <laughs> a little bit in return here. <laughs> I haven't said anything <laughs> negative about it. No, no, it's good. Um, it's good. I feel like I've been doing a pretty good job, actually. So Yeah, I... <laughs> I think my name's in the front, so it's just my narcissism that's causing yes. me to push it a little bit. That's right. Um, so, <laughs> right, uh, yeah, a report of a victory. Yes, right. So exactly. this victory has happened, right? And so the victory is being compared to the victory in Emmaus, and then what happens? The temple is rededicated. So what we should be expecting as we conclude, close the back cover on volume one, and open the front cover on volume two is. Oh, now I'm going to read about the rededication of the temple. Right. And that frames then what we have at the beginning of the book of Acts. And if you remember the atonement episode, we talked about how Christ's atonement purifies not just a, a, any bitty physical space, but the whole world. The whole world. Right. Which is which is illustrated then, for instance, by the fact that you've got uh, Cornelius, this this Gentile centurion who receives the Holy Spirit even before he's baptized. Uh, and then also the you know, the incident where Peter is told to eat these animals that previously have been unclean. And the, the what God says to him is don't call anything unclean that God has made clean. God has made it clean. And how did it become clean? By the atonement that Christ accomplished in his passion, death, and resurrection. Right. And so Christ's blood has now purified the whole cosmos, right? And so now when individual humans receive the laying on of hands and or anointing, the Holy Spirit 
the theophanic glory cloud, the presence of God, comes and fills them. Right? As a as a temple of God. And this starts with the apostles on the day of Pentecost. Right? When when you notice how the wind and the fire come into the room in which they're sitting. Right? So Saint Luke even brings in that spatial idea to where the apostles are, right? But the right. spirit comes and fills not that room, making that room the new temple, but fills them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Fills them. Right. And, and uh, yeah, it, it, I, I think this might be the, this, this might be peak uh, Lord of Spirits episode structure here because literally we're now finally getting to what, what Pentecost yeah. is. <laughs> Um, right, right. This may be the worst offensing offense, <laughs> offense of all of that, uh, that pattern. But I, I think it's to get there, we had to, we had to look at all of that. Right. So, so the Holy Spirit descends into them and, but there's like, there's aftermath now. Right. So just as with the presence of God in the tabernacle and the temple, you had to do the purification you had to do, you know, all everything the right way in order to prepare to be in the presence of God, or else you could die again, death by holiness. Now there are things that happen connected to the fact that the apostles and the church are now effectively the holy of holies, right? So, you know, the classic example, and this was one that always kind of puzzled me when I was a kid. I was never quite sure what to make of it. You've got, uh, you know, in, in, they're still in Jerusalem and, and, um, all the disciples, you know, all the, the Christians are, are pooling their stuff so that no one has to, uh, be in want. Right. Commies. So, yeah, yes. Yes. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's voluntary. Oh. Um, <laughs> but, uh, they, you know, so people are selling property and they're, you know, pooling their money so that everyone can be, uh, no one has to go hungry. And you've got this one couple, Ananias and Sapphira, who decide to sell their property. And instead of giving all of it over to the apostles for the help of the poor, they give only part of it, but then they lie about giving only part, right? So first Ananias lies directly to St. Peter and then he dies. And then he's taken away and then his wife comes in not knowing that he's, he's dead. Uh, and St. Peter asks her the same question, you know, did you give it all? And she says, oh yeah, this is, this is all of it. Which is, as a sidebar, is an interesting note that she is as a as a christian she as a christian woman she is answering for herself she's not simply being lumped in with whatever her husband happens to say like she's actually responsible for herself which is a very different role for women in the ancient world uh you know um and and she lies also and and then also dies and uh you know when i was a kid i read that i'm like that seems a little extreme lord you know like like i mean not that I have any business second, second guessing, you know, God's judgments, but, but, but understanding it in terms of this question of death by holiness, you know, they, they, they're literally bringing an offering to God, right. But doing it in a bad way and lying, that's why and, they die. And St. Peter says, you have not lied to men, but to, to men, the Holy Spirit, but to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit cannot long contend with right. human wickedness. And so Ananias and Sapphira are the Nadab and Abihu of the new covenant. It follows yeah. that St. Luke follows the same pattern here at the beginning of Acts as the dedication right. of the tabernacle. And so then what comes in terms of the Christian life, right? They serve as this kind of warning, right? And so if we are members of Christ's body and therefore our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is in our midst, and Christ is in our midst when we gather in worship, then rather than the commandments and the way that the Torah works in our life being like the old covenant, where it was about purifying this physical space, this external physical space and maintaining its purity in these concentric circles. Now it's gone interior. Right. right? And right. so that's why the Christian life becomes about repentance. It comes about cleansing and purifying and rededicating ourselves. Yeah. 
not a space. Right. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, I don't know the right word to use it's, but it's really powerful to, to look at what's going on in the old Testament there with the tabernacle and the temple and realize that it actually now applies to us as, as persons, because we are, we fulfill that role now if as in as much as we are in Christ. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's give some final comments. Um, there's, uh, the first place I want to start is with that final point, right? Which that that um, when we undertake the fasting, the prayer, the repentance, the asceticism, all of these things that are part of Orthodox Christian life, um, you know, when we undertake these things, it, it's it's it's. I think often we can. Uh, receive that stuff is like there's one way which is people like oh it's this burden I have to have because I'm orthodox um, or sometimes people take it as being like a you know sort of like a, a, a hyper macho thing like oh look at us we're like the marines of Christianity we fast we pray we long services like right you know all, that those ways of looking at it but but fundamentally those are kind of almost materialist ways of understanding these spiritual practices, right? Um, they are disciplines, but a discipline has a purpose. It's not merely just to be disciplined, right? Um, the discipline has a purpose, and the purpose is to prepare us to be in the presence of God. And when we, when we don't do that, then we degrade because it it's it's not it's not good for us to be in the presence of God, and sometimes that degradation can go get so extreme, and our our sin becomes so extreme that we have to be removed from communion until such time as we are prepared to return again, right? So it's 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 purification so that we can worship God, so that we can be in His presence, you know, so that we can be within within the, 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 within the temple, right? We talked earlier about what would Orthodox church life look like if it actually functioned like the tabernacle and temple and how separated we, we would be from God. Now we have the opportunity to be right there in the place where the, where the sacrifice is offered. We have to prepare ourselves to do that. That's what this life is for. It's not just sort of like self-discipline or it's not self-help or becoming better person. It, it you know, it, it can do those things, but that's not what it's for. Um, and the other side I wanted to mention in, in my final remarks is that with the descent of the Holy Spirit into the church and we being in Christ and being his body, being now the temple of the living God, then what that means is uh, the task that Adam and Eve were given back way back in paradise where we started has now been restored to us and we've been given the ability to actually take it further than they, they could have when they were first created because of their immaturity, you know? Um, and that means that our task as Christians is not simply to become better, but rather to take paradise into the world to expand the temple to bring you know because when someone becomes a christian when they are baptized into christ then they are then also part of the temple of the living god they become you know pillars of the temple of the living god right so our task is to churchify the world and we do that uh not only by the the act of evangelism although that is absolutely critical right uh, evangelism is a message. It's the, it's the announcement of Christ's victory. Um, but it's also to, to take on this role of, of, you know, be fruitful, multiply, cultivate the earth. And that doesn't just mean make sure you have a well-mowed backyard. It means bringing God's love and justice and compassion to the people around you right? This is what the task is. This is how we bring the presence of God and his, his making things right and putting things them in order. That's how we participate in that. So this is God's act. It's God. God is the one who expands Eden, but it's our task to be the, the instruments by which that happens. 
So there is both an internal side to it in terms of our own attention to our purification, to meet God, to worship God, to commune with God. And then there's also this external outward initiative taking outgoing side to it as well, where we are to to serve those around us, to sacrifice ourselves for those around us so that they too can participate in this same life. That's that's its purpose. All right. What you got for the end, Father Stephen? No. <laughs> so uh, humans are like TARDISes. <laughs> yes. They're bigger on the inside. <laughs> and I want to focus a little on, we already brushed on, on this a little bit, but the Holy Spirit comes and writes the law, writes the Torah in our hearts. And this is how the New Testament expresses and the Old Testament pro prophesying that it would happen. It talks about that internalization of the law that we were talking about right at the end. And despite the fact that we've probably all heard or read that a thousand times, uh, I don't know how much it has sunk in for us because we still have this focus on the outside and on the external and on our interactions out there with the world. When we think about commandments, whether we're thinking about the 10 commandments of the Old Testament, we're thinking about the commandments of Christ, we're thinking outside. But what this internalization means, and you see it reflected everywhere in Christ's teaching in the gospels, right? Yes, if you have yeast in your house and you don't contain it and treat it properly, it will infect things and infest things and can poison your kids and bad things will happen. But if you allow a little leaven into your heart and your soul and your mind, it will spread and it will infect everything and it will destroy you. The internalizing of that commandment is far more important than the externalizing of it. Hmm. And what Christ communicates to us in the gospels, we read, uh, we read a, a gospel on uh, Sunday for Pentecost where Christ says, uh, talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit, that rivers of water will flow from your belly, <laughs> right? Which is a weird promise to receive. Um, most of us try to keep that from happening. Um, but what he's talking about are the rivers in paradise, the rivers in Eden that flowed out of Eden to water the whole earth right? All that external stuff, what we do in the world in terms of the commandments, how we relate to people, how we relate to the world around us, how we see the world and interact with it, all of that flows out of what's going on inside. And so if we don't keep what's inside of us clean and pure and dedicated to Christ and to his service, then everything that flows out of us is going to be tainted by whatever's wrong inside. You can't get good fruit from a bad tree, rotten tree. And so I think what we need to be reminded of maybe is that keeping the commandments of Christ, living the Christian life always begins by going back into the paradise that's inside of us that the Holy Spirit is put there when we received him within ourselves and maintaining that space with all the zeal that the Levites and the priests of the old covenant had purifying ourselves of sin, rooting it out, finding it, driving it out, repenting of it, repairing what's wrong, confessing, receiving forgiveness and cleansing and purification. And once we maintain that, all of these other things will flow out naturally. The love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the goodness, the faithfulness, the gentleness, the self-control, all the fruits of the spirit will blossom forth when we've done the hard work of getting into the mess and the brokenness and the dirt and the grime and the ugliness that's still lingering around in different places inside of us. So, uh, we talk a lot, and, and Father Andrew just talked about, uh, and rightfully so, 
our need to go out into the world. But we also need to not forget to go inside of ourselves and take care of the temple, care for the temple, purify and rededicate the temple uh, that lies within us. And so now I have a question for Father Andrew. Oh boy. If I sing Spring Up O Well, will you yell the splish splash <laughs> oh, man. in the background? Wow. <laughs> that is a very dim, dim memory in, in a very shriveled part of my brain. Glad to bring it back. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, with on that note, that is our show for tonight. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. If you didn't get a chance to call in during the live broadcast, we'd love to hear from you either via email at lordofspirits at ancientfaith.com or you can message us at our Lord of Spirits podcast Facebook page. We do read everything, but we can't respond to everything. But we do save what you send for possible use in future episodes. And join us for our live broadcasts on the second and fourth Thursdays of the month at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. And if you are on Facebook, like our page, join our discussion group, leave reviews and ratings everywhere. But most importantly, share this show with a friend whom you know is going to love it. Or even if you just think they'll love it, go yeah. ahead and share it. Yeah. And finally, be sure to go to ancientfaith.com, stroke support, and help make sure we and a lot of other AFR podcasters stay on the air. Thank you very much, and may God bless you always. You've been listening to The Lord of Spirits with Orthodox Christian priests, Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung, a listener-supported presentation of Ancient Faith Radio. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts, and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, and riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 through 12. marriages and families in the faith. The Center for Family Care, a ministry of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese, nurtures and empowers families, helping them navigate the joys and challenges of life. Its ministry focuses on equipping families to apply the teachings and practices of the Orthodox faith to every dimension of their lives. This podcast will feature interviews, reflections, book reviews, and narratives that will encourage dialogue and strengthen families. Welcome to Family Matters. My name is Father Alex Gusetis, and today we are speaking with Presidenta Christine Chambers Monkowski. Our topic is organ donation, family decisions. Presidenta Christine received a Bachelor of Science from Drexel University in Philadelphia, and later completed a Master in Theological Studies at Holy Cross Orthodox School of Theology in Brookline, Massachusetts. She's married to Father Paul Mankowski, their parish, Saints Cyril and Methodius in Lorraine, Ohio, is under the Bulgarian Diocese of the OCA. In her secular work, Christina's has worked at the Cleveland Clinic for 15 years. She was a medical ombudsman there for five years, and for the last 10 years, she has served as the clinic's organ donation coordinator and is part of their end-of-life care team. In this role, she works as liaison to LifeBank, the organ procurement organization in Northeast Ohio. Welcome, Christine. Thanks for having me, Father. I'd like to begin by reading the pastoral guidelines of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America regarding the donation of organs. Quote, although nothing in the Orthodox tradition requires the faithful to donate their organs to others, Nevertheless, this practice may be considered an act of love, and as such, is encouraged. The decision to donate a duplicate organ, such as a kidney, 
while the donor is living requires much consideration and should be made in consultation with medical professionals and one's spiritual father. The donation of an organ from a deceased person is also an act of love that offers the recipient a longer, fuller life. Such donations are acceptable if the deceased donor had willed such action, or if surviving relatives permit it, providing that it was in harmony with the desires of the deceased. Such actions can be approved as an expression of love and the self-determination of the donor. In all cases, respect for the body of the donor should be maintained. Close quote. Much more can be added regarding the scriptural and theological support of this position. But our purpose here is to dialogue on a practical, medical, and emotional dimension of organ donation. And Christine is on the front lines of this process. Can you tell us about how you became involved in this work? Yes. Um, I was, as you noted, an ombudsman at the clinic uh, for a number of years. And uh, in that capacity, I really end up having a lot of really pretty intense conversations with families and also uh, knew my way through the clinic um, uh, very well in terms of, you know, each institute and doctors and nurses in each institute. Um, so it put me in a particularly um, unique situation when the position became available uh, for the organ donation coordinator. Um, a friend of mine had recommended me for the position, and I'm really glad he did. I think it's one of the few things I would have um, wanted to do outside of being an ombudsman. It, ombudsman was a fabulous job, but this is pretty incredible. So it's really given me a quite a, I can say more than perfect time. I mean, it's a tough time to be with people at the end of life, but it is clearly a very um, sacred time to be with people. So I really, as I got more involved with the role um, and really developing our end of life care team at the clinic, um, it, it just has given me an opportunity really to work very closely with families and discuss this decision outside of the hospital and inside the hospital. And so I welcome the opportunity today. Thank you. So what's the process or the procedure of organ donation? So as the statement you read from the church notes, Father, there's living donation and then there's donation from a deceased donor. So uh, what most people see in the news with the living donation is a person is evaluated by the hospital's living donor team, uh, confirms that they're a match for the recipient, and then a surgery date is scheduled. Usually this is kidney or liver, and that organ is recovered from the living donor and then immediately transplanted into the recipient. So they both stay in the hospital to recuperate. But today we're talking really about deceased donor situations. And that's a lot more complicated uh, than what we just described in the living donor situation. So first of all, when we say organ donation, we're actually talking about organ tissue and eye donation. And organ donation can be considered for patients at end of life who are on a ventilator. So that would be patients who are in an intensive care unit in the hospital. Tissue and eye donation can be considered for those patients in the intensive care unit we just discussed, but also it's considered for every deceased person immediately. So immediately following their death, they can be considered for donation, whether that be in a hospital, a hospice, or a care facility. So when we focus on donation, organ donation itself, I think it's, we really have to be honest to say that most people are not familiar at all about how this miracle of donation actually works. We see it on TV and in the movies and suddenly uh, someone has uh, donated an organ and the other person uh, has received the organ and then immediately following that the families are meeting and thrilled at what has happened. But that's not the reality. It's a complex process and it's designed to ensure that the gifts of the donor save as many lives as possible. So I think it's important to first talk about for a minute who can actually donate organs. Um, so not everyone passes away uh, in a manner where they can be an, an organ donor. In fact, a very small percentage of people die in a manner that allows them to have their organs recovered for transplant. 
Um, as we mentioned, as I mentioned a little earlier, the person is on a uh, ICU. So the organs have to be continued to receive blood and they have to be viable for transplant. The person must be on a ventilator. Um, so in most of these situations, the potential donor, 